Okay, that's enough of that music. I hope uh, you will not get that out of your head when you try to sleep at home. Hi, I'm Martin, and I'm here to host the second block of Pyjamas. And I hope you're all having a good time uh, listening to all these Python-related talks. And in uh, this block, we have scheduled six live talks and uh, three recorded talks. And so make sure you stick around for uh, most of the time because then you can ask the live speakers questions in the chat and can find out uh, uh, of other ways to contact them and maybe learn something extra when you're watching them live. And if you don't have the time, uh, they are also being recorded and on the live stream you could even um, um, rewind this. So let's, let's get rid of all these banners and just before we get started, uh, a short reminder that uh, if you have not joined the Discord channel yet, um, you can go there and also visit the sponsor where you can get a little crypto thing for your crypto wallet if you have one and find out uh, about other services they offer. Now, the first scheduled talk for uh, this block is a recorded one and it's by Daniel C. Mora and he has uh, an interesting way of using SQL with Python in the middle. So I'm going to let you watch the talk and uh, see you in half an hour.
number one, hi pajamas. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so uh, my name is Daniel and I'm a computer scientist and engineer. Uh, I'm principal data scientist at Venium, a startup where we are disrupting vehicle connectivity. Uh, and I'm, I'm here today presenting SpyQuill for the very first time. So this is a, a side project that I'm developing. Uh, I, I think it's it's time for SpyQuill to see the light of day. So here we go. Um, so what is SpyQuill? Uh, SpyQuill or Sp SpyQuill, if you want, uh, is a new query language um, that mixes SQL and Python. <clears throat> So uh, two, two languages that are familiar to, 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 to many developers. Um, so SpyQuill brings a, a command line tool that allows you to query data uh, and transform data from one format to the other. We'll see more. So there, there are several uh, language and tools that are related to, to SpyQuill. And, uh, I, I used all of them, or many of them, in, in my day-to-day, -day. Uh, but I, I had to switch from one tool to the other, depending on the task, depending on, on, the, on the format of the files, um, and, and on the size of the data, uh, actually. Um, so if I was using a CSV file, so if I had a CSV from a customer, I'll use AWK or OC, uh, or Q, um, but OC, uh, it's it's great for CSVs and, and files like that, uh, not so great for JSON. Uh, Q, on the other hand, it loads everything to a, a, a database in memory, a SQL lit database in memory, so it kind of limits the, the, the size of the data you can process in your machine. Um, if, if I had JSON, I'll go with JQ. Uh, but again, it has a. It only supports JSON, and it has a very specific language, which I was like a little bit lazy to 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 learn in depth. Um, and I I also use Spark a lot. Um, but Spark is great. It handles a lot of different formats. It can scale very well. But if you are like writing queries, it can. It takes a long time just to just to execute the query it's kind of over overkill for for most of of the tasks um so i i i felt that there was like a gap in the ecosystem and and that that brought me the idea to to develop spike well first as a as a tool just for my own use but now uh, as an open source tool that i hope you like so here's an example of a SpyQuill uh, query. Uh, let, let's try to make it, break it apart. So we have the, the SQL part. So SQL provides the structure. You should be familiar with, with, uh, with the select, uh, from, where, order, by, along uh, others, uh, as well as the alias uh, for giving names to, to the outputs columns. <clears throat> Also, um, what's, what you might find differently here uh, is, are, are two things. First, there's uh, in the from clause, instead of having a table or something, uh, you have an input format. Um, and second, uh, in the two clause, there's, there's a two clause, which is new to SQL, and it defines the output format. So here we have a clear intent. Um, to handle different formats, uh, so and 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 to focus on a single data stream, so making it simpler than than SQL, um, and and then for defining the expressions, the conditions, and so forth, we use Python. So Python uh, using Python means several things. First. Uh, you have all Python ecosystem at your mercy, so uh, you can load any uh, library, any mod module you want. Uh, the second, you, you can use objects uh, and and data structures like lists, dictionaries, sets uh, in your selects with is. So these these are concepts that. Uh, 
are not natural to SQL because you know SQL is about my age <laughs> it is uh, 40 years old or so and uh, and when it was born there wasn't object-oriented programming and stuff like that uh, and uh, a third uh, today everyone knows a little bit of Python so coding these expressions should feel, should, should feel familiar for, for you um, we, we did have to introduce um, a new concept uh, the concept of null type uh, for handling uh, missing values gracefully so Python as, as the known type um, but any operation you do with none will will throw an exception so the new type tries to uh, have a similar behavior to SQL's null allowing to do operations with nulls and then resulting in a new value instead of uh, throwing an error uh, you, you'll see more in the in the demo that I'll I'll do just uh, next. Um, so this is the, the complete structure of SpyQL queries. So um, I'll, I'll try to cover most of it in, in the next demo. Um, we'll start with very simple selects uh, on top of CSV and JSON data, and then we will do some sorts, some grouping, uh, and also import uh, Python model uh, for you to get a, a feeling of how it works. So I'll be using the latest version of SpyQL and uh, we'll get a CSV from Kegel uh, where each record describes a customer profile on a marketing campaign. So there's a lot of columns here, so let's use SpyQL to select some of them. Uh, for instance, uh, <clears throat> year of birth of the customer, the education, marital status, income, and how many web purchases did the customer do. Um, we are reading from a CSV, uh, just let's get the first 10 um, rows. Uh, now, with SpyQL you can export this to, to JSON. Um, let's just uh, pipe this into JQ, sorry, uh, into JQ to, <clears throat> to have better formatting. Um, and you, you can see here, for instance, by looking at the, the income, uh, the year of birth, and the number of purchases, that uh, SpikeWall is detecting that these fields are integers and is casting uh, automatically. It's also detecting the header file. You didn't need to, to, to specify anything about it. Um, <clears throat> so. Another output that I like when looking to the data is the pretty printing. Uh, so basically it's a tabular format uh, where everything is lined up um, <clears throat> in an easy to, to read way. Um, so let's do some filters. Uh, for instance, let's make uh, only, only get purchases with more than, than uh, records with more than nine purchases and we see here that we have a case where the income is null so basically uh, there was an empty string there uh, the uh, spike wheel converted to null um, so it's it's a missing value it's a it's a feature that we don't have in Python in Python we have none the none type uh, but the none time uh, breaks very easily so if you do a sum or do any operation with none uh, you will get an exception so we created the null type so that you can do operations on top of missing data uh, and the the result uh, will be null as in sql uh, so here we are dividing by 1000 and still uh, no problem there with that null it's still null um, so another thing you can do with nulls is replace them by a default value, in this case, or replace by zero, uh, or you can filter them out. So you can you can change your <clears throat> where clauses uh, to filter the, the the cases where income is not uh, no where where income is null. And, and here you go. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, now, 
let's do some ordering in this case by the fifth column in the sending way uh, uh, so you, you can you can choose a Python expression here you can you can you can do a lot of stuff uh, but we, we we have kept the the SQL way of doing it also which is uh, specifying the column number uh, the output column number you want to order it and another nice nice thing you can do it is to uh, write the output to SQL format in this case to insert statements um, you can you can customize this uh, at some extent so you can you can choose the table name uh, and you can choose to group uh, the 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 records into into uh, chunks. Uh, if you put chunk size as one as as output now, we will get one insert statement uh, per per record. Uh, this is uh, not very efficient if if you are inserting a lot of data uh, in your database. Uh, so by default, we group a lot of uh, a lot of records but th this will depend very much on your use case if you're doing like stream inserting or if you are importing a file into the database either way um, this output format enables you to inject very easily data from different formats like JSON CF, CSV among others into your your Postgres MySQL or uh, SQLite databases among others um, <clears throat> So let's go back to the JSON uh, and let's export the full file uh, into JSON format uh, and, and save it in a new file. Okay, here we go. Some warnings, converting, let's look into it. So, okay, one JSON per line, this is JSON lines format. Um, and now let's see how we can query uh, JSON files. So it's typically the same, select, uh, but now we have a single column which is called JSON. We are seeing that we are reading from JSON and we are setting the output to JSON again. Uh, so let's just get the first 10 records. Um, and this is a, this JSON uh, is, um, is a dictionary. Uh, so we can, for instance, print the keys if we want to. Uh, and here we go. These are the the keys of our uh, of the the first record. Um, so you can do anything you can do with with Python dictionaries because these are more or less the same. Um, and <clears throat> let's now see how we can access these keys. So the same way as in the dictionary, for instance, using the get method, but or also um, by by key uh, and we have actually uh, introduced uh, a new way of accessing uh, dictionary entries uh, where you don't need to use quotes. Uh, you just use this new operator, uh, which is a, a little bit handier than that. But it's it's exactly the same. Uh, these are exactly the same thing. Uh, just it's just syntax sugar to make your life easier. Um, and for instance, if you, if if there is a missing key or something, there is no issue. This oops, it doesn't exist. There's no problem. It returns null. Um, so uh, even if you, even if it's null and you access a property inside a null property, that's uh, no no issue again. Uh, so Spike will tries to break as little as possible so that you can keep processing your data um, as you go <clears throat> so um, yeah uh, and if you do arithmetic on top of that no issue as, as we have seen it before so uh, let's now try to for instance count the number of records inside the the file so you can use this like a count star uh, but here in, in spike well we instead of count we use count a gigi so all um, all uh, aggregation functions have this suffix uh, to avoid conflicts with the already existing Python functions like the sum function for instance um, <clears throat> so in 
with 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 uh, with command line tools you typically use a word count to do that you'll see that you have an extra row that's because of the header if we force the header false uh, we get the same result uh, with spike ul um, so spike ul detects the header and doesn't count it as a row as expected as typical sql um, so we get a more uh, intuitive behavior than using the linux tools uh, so let's just put some some more um, now we are counting how many income fields are not null like in SQL so we have a slightly lower value than with a count star because there are several some some null entries on on, on that field um, and we can do some 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 sums for instance <clears throat> But but first let's disable the these warnings. Uh, and now let's add some some sums, uh, other aggregations, like the the number of purchases. Let's call it total. So uh, if we 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 want you can group this let's for instance group this uh, uh, by marital status so how many uh, customers ha have we got by marital status how much uh, how, how many web purchases do they do and so forth so again we are grouping by the first column uh, we can now for instance sort this output uh, and let's uh, for instance uh, sort by total so let's sort by the fourth column um, in, in, in the sending way to get the higher totals at the end so married people uh, have the highest number of purchases uh, and, and now I, I wanted to, to show you uh, something uh, which is yet another format uh, that uh, that spike well introduces uh, which is uh, the spy format. Uh, this is mainly a re internal representation um, of of how SpyQL uh, stores data internally, and uh, this format is mainly used uh, when when you want to pipe uh, queries. So SpyQL doesn't support uh, the having statement. So what we typically do in those cases is to pipe this into another query and then do a where uh, filter in the second query and the spy format is is a is a very efficient way of moving data from one query to the next uh, so here we get exactly the same output as we got before now let's do the format on top of the total and that's it now let's do an aggregation of this uh i wanted to show you a a, a very uh special feature on, on, on spike ul that makes writing uh, some some kinds of operations easier than in standard sql um, so let's aggregate the marital status uh, by joining the, the the strings let's sum the number of records and let's sum the total uh, number of purchases um, and we'll get the single record of course but what i wanted to show you now is that uh, by simply adding a keyword to your select statement uh, instead of getting this uh, single record at the end you can get one record uh, by input record with the partial results uh, this is uh, in, in, in standard SQL these are called uh, window functions or analytical functions uh, which have a proper syntax here we just need to add the partials and as you see we get uh, the result of the married the married and together married together and single and so forth and you get the running sums um, and running totals uh, for, for this just by adding uh, the partial um, keyword to, to our select um and other you can also ha have a column and you'll get a column even with using the partials that's okay you can use other functions like the lag function which will get the result from the previous record uh lag function also 
allows you to get the result from two records before, three records before, and so forth. So you you can do a lot uh, with this with this uh, simple uh, command line tool uh, with a very straightforward syntax that is easy to 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 read and easy to remember, um, and which is which is powered by by Python. So whatever. Python code you have or Python library you use or model you can you can use it here. So now I wanted to to show you um, yet a, another feature which is you can read data from a spike from a, a Python expression. Here we just generating numbers from zero to nine. But for instance, let's for uh, let's now see how we can import a library. And here we're importing NumPy uh, and if you don't have NumPy installed, you just need to do pip install NumPy, and that's it. And we're generating uh, a sequence of numbers from 0 to 6Py, um, and, 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 and that's it. So it's very easy to import any, any library and use it right away in your uh, SPIKE UL. Here is there is an error, that's okay, we, we, we correct it, um, and, and that's it. And, there's yet another output that I wanted to show you. Um, let's just do some function on top of this of these values, and now let's plot it to the terminal. Uh, so SpikeWell also has this handy feature if you want to plot um, something with with a legend uh, describing uh, what what you're seeing. Okay, so uh, as you've seen, we, we can do a, a lot with, with SpikeWell. We, we haven't covered it all, but you can get a, a good grasp on it. Uh, so there's a lot more recipes in the, in the README on the repo uh, if, if you like to learn more. So just to end some highlights. Um, so SpikeWell guarantees the, the row order, which, which makes it ideal to play with our command tools and to easily run analytical functions. As we've seen with a, with a partials keyword, we, we can transform aggregations into analytical functions very easily. <clears throat> Unlike Python programs, uh, SpikeWell uh, is uh, spike all programs are one-liners uh, by, by design. So this, this also makes it ideal to use in, in the command line. Um, you, you can leverage the full Python ecosystem. So <laughs> the sky is the limit here. Uh, so you can also bring your own code um, very easily. We haven't touched uh, on that on the demo, uh, but you, you have a, uh, a init file where you can, uh, init Python file where you can put any Python code you want there. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and SpikeWall is, is is designed to work with uh, multiple data formats, mainly CSV and JSON, but you, you can easily work with XMLs, YAMLs, and so forth uh, by le leveraging other uh, utils. Just just look at the recipes, and and you got some some nice examples there. Um, so this is it. Uh, I, I hope you liked it, and I, I hope it, you find it as useful as I have. So don't waste any time and run pip install SpikeWell now. Um, so it's super easy to install, it's just, just like installing a, a Python model. Uh, so I love to hear from you about uh, what you think, future requests, uh, how are you using uh, SpikeWell. Uh, and I'll really, really love uh, to be reviewing a pull request from one of you guys sometime from now. If you like the project, please give it a star on GitHub. Uh, this is SpikeWell's debut, so any help kicking off the project is welcome. Thank you very much. Hope to hear from you guys.
and thanks for everybody who helped out in the chat reminding me that the microphone was mute uh, that's one thing that we do new this year we play the videos directly from StreamYard which means that now as a speaker uh, or as a host I have to mute and unmute my video and I will probably forget that more than once so uh, please ping me if you can't hear anything um, I'm really glad that uh, I can welcome our next speaker Rodrigo Jiao Sao uh, I hope I got your name kind of right Hello. Yeah, kind of. Hello. <laughs> it's it's quite it's quite hard. Um, it today you you want to talk to us about elegant Python code, and you've done something like that for EuroPython as well. So is this like the second part of it? It's it's a, it's similar in format, but it's different in content. So okay, yeah. yeah, this this is great because we enjoyed the other one, and I hope that you are going to give us some more good ideas. So I'm going to turn on your uh, uh, screen share and hope that you have a great talk. Thank you, Martin. So hello, everyone. Welcome. Like Martin tried to say, and I don't blame Martin. Uh, my name is Rodrigo Giron Serrão, and I'm here to talk to you about writing elegant Python code. But before we start, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. This is my face right here, but hopefully you can see two of me. So this is a picture and then you can see my face live. I have a formal education in applied mathematics. I've been writing Python code for nine years now. And my main occupation is in training and teaching of Python and mathematics and related subjects on my website. And also I do some APL uh, teaching and training for Dialog Limited. APL is another programming language. And then I also do some Python freelancing. And I just like to invite you to follow me on Twitter at MathsPPBlog because throughout the talk, or rather not throughout the talk, but the talk is based on a couple of references and a couple of links, and I will be sharing them later. And they will be in the slides, but I will also publish all of them on Twitter. And I think it's, um, it's useful for you to be able to find all of the links there as I publish them after the talk. So I want to jump straight into the talk, but um, first I want to tell you just a short story. I'm not entirely sure if you're aware of this, but the conference uh, encourages people or encourages the speakers to wear their pajamas while they are presenting. And I wanted to play along with this. I wanted to follow the dress code. And so I decided to, to go and buy a nice, um, a nice pajamas to wear during the talk. And so I think one or two weeks ago, um, I went to the metro to, to, to ride the metro to the, to the store I was going to. And while I was in the metro, I thought, well, maybe I could start preparing the talk. And for the talk, I wanted to talk about this um, swap casing function that I want to define. And it's, it's a simple function. It's very easy to understand what this function does. I want it to accept a string. And then I want to build a result string. Maybe let's make this larger. I want to build a result string and the way I build it is simple. I'll just iterate over all of the legal indices into the string and then I'll do the following. If the character I'm looking at is equal to itself in uppercase, then I have an uppercase character at hand. And so I want to take the result and I want to add the lowercase version of this same character. And otherwise I want to take the result and I want to concatenate or to concatenate the uppercase version of this character. And by the time I'm done, I want to return the results. And what this does is it defines this simple function that accepts a string and it's going to swap the casing of all of the characters. As you can see, the H and the W were uppercase and in the result they are lowercase and then all other characters were lowercase and now they are uppercase and things like punctuation and spaces, they are left untouched. So I was in the metro and I was typing this and thinking about what I was going to, to do at this conference. But then the metro arrived at the station and well, obviously I had to leave. So I put the phone in my pocket and then I went back to the surface and I walked into the store. And as I walk into the store, I, I go up to the counter and I see an employee there and there's the name tag that says um, that the employee is called Alex. And so I call Alex and I say, hey, Alex, um, I need some help with some code. And Alex turns to me and says, well, absolutely. Uh, do you need help with Python code? And I'm, I, was, I was caught off guard by that question because I was, I was in, a, in a clothing store. And I say, no, actually, I wanted help with a dress code. 
because I will be talking at a Python conference and I need some nice pajamas to wear during the conference. And Alex says, oh yeah, right. I know, I actually know what conference you're talking about. I'll, I'll actually be attending. I can definitely help you out. We just have to go over there and I'll show you our nicest pajamas. And, and then I thank Alex and I say, yeah, absolutely. I do need that because my pajamas, they all look very neutral. Actually, I'm wearing one right now. This is my pajamas and you can not tell it apart from a regular t-shirt. And so I want to be wearing something that clearly shows I'm following the dress code of the conference. But actually, Alex, let me take you up on your offer. Um, would you mind taking a look at some code I just wrote and help me out? See if it's there, if there's anything else I can do to make it more elegant. And so Alex looks at the code, looks at it for a second, and then looks at me, squints at it, and then says, and then says, wait, I recognize you. You're Hudri, right? I, I know you from your um, talk on writing elegant Python code that you did um, for Flascon, right? And I, I smile a little bit and I say, yeah, that's me. And then Alex proceeds to saying, well, why are you not following your own advice? Because you talked about for loops and how powerful and idiomatic they can look. And you're doing this. I think you're doing this wrong, Rodrigo. But I'll, I'll leave you with your code. I'll let you fix it. And I'll go in the back, look for a nice pajamas for you. And so Alex leaves me alone with my code and my thoughts. And I'm a little bit embarrassed because Alex is absolutely right. There's something here that I could do in a much better way. Because in case you don't know, this this code, this is a pattern that's very common for people to use, but it's generally not what they want. So you generally do not want to compute the range of the length of something. Because it might it might look it it might look, sorry, like I care about the indices, but what I care about really is the characters at those positions. And so I don't need to compute the indices to get the characters. I can just take my whole function. And I can get the characters directly if I iterate over the string. And now that I'm holding the characters one by one, I can replace these indexing operations with the character itself. And now the function is looking just a little bit better, a little bit more elegant. And we can make sure I didn't break the function. And so this was great. I had just improved my function thanks to Alex. And I wanted to, to, to thank Alex for the help but Alex hadn't still returned. So I was still alone and I thought, well, maybe I can just look at the code and see if there's anything else I can do to make it better. And so I decided to take my code and obviously all good programmers copy and paste their code every single time. So that's what we'll be doing. And I keep looking at the code and thinking about the conference that Alex mentioned. And then I remembered, wait, there's, there's something else I can do here because if you, if you look at this right here, if you look at the if else block, you can see that the structure of both cases is very similar. I want to take the result and concatenate something to it. It's just that the if statement is being used to switch between one of two values. And so I was thinking about this and then I see Alex returning and Alex is holding one of these eye covering things and Alex walks up to me and says, Rodrigo, I found this thing. I know this is not a pajamas, but people wear this when they go to bed, you know, to cover their eyes. So maybe you could wear this during the conference. And so I said, yeah, absolutely. I'll just, I'll, I'll give it a try, you know, let's see if, it's, if it fits me, if it looks nice. Let's see if it makes sense. And so I decided to put this on. And then I kept on talking to Alex and saying, well, Alex, I was looking at this piece of code and I was thinking, maybe I could replace this with a conditional expression, which is just an expression that, well, evaluates to one of two values depending on a condition. And so what I would do is I would take the results and I would append the lowercase version of the character if the character matches its uppercase version. Otherwise, I'll just have the uppercase version of the character. And so me and Alex exchanged a couple of thoughts on this. But then I said, no, wait, I don't, I don't like this eye covering thing because plenty of people wear it on airplanes. And I want the audience to understand that I'm wearing a pajama, not, or I'm wearing my pajamas, not just some random thing that people wear on airplanes. And so I said, well, Alex, I would 
I would appreciate if you find something better for me to wear. And so Alex completely agrees with me. And we just check that I didn't break my function. And then Alex was leaving, but turns to me and says, wait, I just, I just remembered that there's this thing. It's a programmer's responsibility to use the right tool for the job, right? And obviously I agreed with Alex. And so I think there's something else we can do here. I'm pretty sure we can improve this because strings have so many methods. There must be something useful for this comparison. And Alex proceeded and said, I don't quite remember the name of the method we care about, but I'm pretty sure it starts with is. So if you take a look at those methods, I'm sure you'll find something useful for you. And then Alex takes the, the, the blindfold thingy, goes away into, I don't know, maybe a storage room or something, and leaves me once more alone with my code and my thoughts. And so I start thinking about these string methods that Alex was mentioning, and there's plenty of them. So it's, I think it's understandable that I don't know all of them by heart. And I, then I thought, well, maybe I could use the dir function to look at all of the, the methods that strings have. But then remember that Alex told me that the method probably starts with is. So what I can do is I can take a look at all of the attributes that I can take from the dir of the string, but I can look only at those that start. So I can check if the attribute starts with is. And when I do that, I get a nice list of attributes and once more, Alex was right. There's the is upper method right here. And I'm pretty sure you can guess what it does. So you give it a string. So let's see, just a bunch of characters and you can use it to check if the string is uppercase. And obviously you can use it on a single character. For example, this should return false. And if you use it on an uppercase A, it returns true. So what we can do is we can take our code we can paste it here and instead of doing this comparison by hand, we can use the appropriate method. And lo and behold, we still haven't broken our code and we're making it a little bit more to the point. So it's not about making your code very short because shorter code doesn't mean better code. It's about making the code expressive and ex you want it to express exactly what you want to do. And so once more, I wanted to thank Alex for the help, but Alex hadn't returned yet. And so I kept on looking at my code and trying to see if I could improve it. And then it struck me once more, I had another idea because there's another pattern that people employ a lot, but that could be replaced by something better. And I'll show you what the pattern is. If, and you'll, you'll see this all the time. Someone initializes an empty list and then they write something like, Oh, let's go over all of the elements in some iterable. And then what we want to do is we take the list and we append the elements to that list. But first we pre-process it with some function. And this is a very, very common pattern. And this can be rewritten as a list comprehension, which is a more expressive way of doing this. And so what we do is we take the function and we pre-process the elements for each element in the iterable. And there's plenty of reasons I could argue that the list comprehension is preferable here, but I think that the most important one is this. In a list comprehension, the thing that comes first, the thing that's highlighted, the thing that you see first is the processing of the element, which really is the important thing. Whereas in here, the thing that you see first is the fact that we are appending to the list. So in the for loop, you're essentially, your eyes get attracted to the boilerplate, whereas in the list comprehension, the processing of the element is put in, 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 a, in a highlighted position. So it's easier to understand what's going on, what's happening to each element. And well, I'm not really using a list here and I'm not appending to a list, but I'm doing something similar. I have a string, which you can think of as a list of characters. And instead of well appending, I'm just concatenating at the end. So we can take this and rewrite this as a list comprehension. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to say that the result is going to be a list. And now this list right here is going to iterate over each character in the string and it's going to apply this transformation, right? So what we can do is let's take this from here. Let's remove all of this. And let's say that we want to do this transformation for each character in the string. Now, this looks very long because I'm zoomed in a lot, but this is still a short line if you take into account the maximum line width that is recommended for Python code. And now what we can do is, obviously we have a list of characters. So what we want to do is we want to return the join of this list. So we can take this and put it over there. And so I was looking at the code and thinking that it's it's looking much better. Um, I'm 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 pretty happy about this code. And then I I look around for Alex to see if Alex is coming, and I see Alex running towards me. And saying, well, Alex walks up to me or runs up to me and says, Rodrigo, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I took so long, but I was actually looking at the at the theory of string, and I realized that we've been doing this wrong. We, we are supposed to use the right tool for the job and we are completely missing the fact that there is a tool that does the job. And once more, I was a little bit puzzled by Alex's statement, but Alex just said, well, type in the zero string in your REPL and take a look at it. And so I did, and I looked at the zero of the string and it's very, very long because strings have so many methods. But if you scroll down enough, you find this method right there, the swap case method. And if you ask for the help information on swap case, sorry, my bad, <laughs> on the swap case, which is a method of the string, so string.swap case, you see that it converts uppercase characters to lowercase and lowercase characters to uppercase. So this was essentially what I was trying to do, except my whole, the whole all of the work I had done was rendered useless uh, by Alex's discovery. And so I was I was feeling a bit sad, you know, because I had just wasted so much time uh, working on this. And Alex, very nice, just comforts me and says, well, Rodrigo, it's okay. It's, it's, it's not like you have to know all of the string methods by heart. It's, it's part of your growth as a programmer to get to know these methods and other tools that are built into the language. And I know, I know this doesn't make up for it, but I found you a nice robe that you can wear during the conference. And I'll put it on now. You can try it on. And I think you'll like it and your audience will enjoy it because it's it's a, a nice light shade of pink and it has it has these little squares and it has some white white faded stripes in there. And I think I think people will like it when you present with the robe. With the robe on. And so, well, I, I thank Alex for, for the help and I just go home. And yeah, I mean, I, I did get a new robe, but it's, uh, well, I, I, I just lost the things that I wanted to talk about. So this was essentially the story of how I was trying to prepare a presentation to, you know, to give a talk on something, but then ended up not having anything to talk about. And I just want you to, to take this as, or the moral of the story is, you will eventually reinvent the wheel, even if not on purpose, and that's fine. It's just your job, it's your responsibility as a programmer to try and figure out what things have already been done. And so in our journey of writing more elegant code with Alex's help, let's just take a look at the things we've done. So we started out by figuring out that we were using a wrong uh, pattern in our for loops. And so we refactored it to traverse directly over the sequence that we cared about. Then we used the conditional expression to, well, conditionally evaluate an expression because that's what they're for. We wanted to pick either, we wanted to pick one of two different values depending on a condition. And so we used a conditional expression for that. We leveraged appropriate methods that did the job that we wanted. So instead of checking, 
ad hoc if a character was uppercase, we use the appropriate method, the is upper method. And then we replaced another pattern with the list comprehension. And the ITM here is the initialize then modify. We were initializing a list as an empty list, and then we were modifying it. And so we replaced that pattern with the list comprehension. And then all of this was rendered slightly useless because there was a method that solved the task. And so we could use it instead of the, instead of the, well, the whole code I was trying to write. And I just realized I didn't even show you, I mean, I showed you the name, but I didn't even show you how it works. So let me just close this section off. You just type the string, swap case, and it obviously does what we were trying to do. So there's that. So the things that we've been doing, the little refactorings, they were based off of a, a couple of articles that you see referenced here. And these are the Python's articles. So it's, it's a series of articles I publish and they are aimed at teaching you how to use the core features of Python or the features of core Python. And there's also here the link to the talk that Alex mentioned. So you can read up on the things I mentioned. And once again, or well, actually not. Well, these first references the for the Python's articles, I compiled them. I have them compiled into an ebook that you can get for free at pythons.com. So feel free to grab the ebook to to you know to read up on all the things I mentioned and also on other talks. And then all of these links, I'll publish them on Twitter after um, I'm done with the talk. Now we have a couple of minutes. I'll be I'll gladly take any questions. Uh, if there aren't any questions now, you can always reach out to me later at um, rodrigo at mathspp.com. I love meeting new folks. Send me an email with your feedback. I appreciate all honest feedback. And I'll be taking live questions. And if, well, and I, I'll probably also hang out in the Discord of the conference for a little bit. So thank you for your time and talk to you soon. Bye. Thanks. Okay, let's take the screen off. And okay, that was that was very interesting. Thank you. And I, I loved how you build up the whole thing. Because that's the thoughts that I have in my head when I'm typing code all the time, like, yeah. Oh, I should be, I should be like, uh, reading the um, standard library documentation, because uh, one of the things that you uh, usually forget after a while is that maybe you should just pick a random chapter and read it. And every time you yeah. do that, you see something and say, Oh, I could be using that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I do that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I also like the explanation you did on the um, list comprehension, because the idea to say, oh, this is because it's easier to read and easier to understand. Uh, because normally you will hear this, oh, it's because we don't want to do plus equals for strings because we're going to make yeah. a new string all the time. But yeah, the um, other argument like, oh, let's have readable code. Yeah, I mean, this. I'll be completely honest with you. I was rehearsing yesterday, literally yesterday, and then it struck me. Actually, it's a great, it's a great argument in favor of list comprehension is that the transformation is put right there in front of you instead of being hidden in the middle of all of the boilerplate. So it just struck me yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. And and I, I love them. And also, uh, since you've been doing this in uh, Jupyter Notebook, um, it's so great to build your comprehension in a notebook because then you can actually see it in the middle steps and yeah. it might be a bit more difficult to write one if you write the whole thing from your memory and then it just doesn't work. But if you're yeah, using absolutely. the notebook, which is perfect for experimenting, then of course that is great. Yeah, okay, you. so let's let's have a quick look at the YouTube chat. I don't see any direct questions, uh, but you have, um, well, we get like great storytelling and great talks. Yeah. So everybody likes your talk. And great. one reason why there's no question is probably because uh, you explained everything so well that there is no need for that. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Well, thanks, so, Martin. Yeah, and I hope to have you back next year for the uh, next pajamas because we're probably going to do this again, though, as this is the third year, and it has always been so much fun to do um, talks with people from around the world. 
So, uh, I invite everybody to just uh, check the uh, Twitter. Um, again, please post your Twitter handle in the chat when we're done with this. Or if not, I'll do that so that somebody who has an, um, not paid attention then can f find you and follow you. So you gain some new followers out of this. Okay, Thanks, thank you very much and hope to see you soon. Bye. And uh, I will, let's, let's, let's look at the time. Uh, we're a little bit early uh, for the next uh, talk. So uh, let's just remind you that we do have a Discord where you can go in and visit, uh, for example, also a sponsor who wants to give you some information, the sponsor being Microsoft. And there is Pact Publishing, uh, who also uh, want to uh, do like a um, competition where, uh, let's let's see, uh, okay, uh, anyway. Um, Tech, technical fun. Uh, well, they, they also offer a competition where you can win stuff, so please go on the Discord and have, have a look at that. Um, and the other thing, of course, you uh, this uh, I have to remind you that this is a whole day, and a whole day of 24 hours means that we really are going to be on until 8 o'clock uh, UTC tomorrow morning. And there's going to be uh, more than half of the talks live. So if you have not planned for anything you want to do today, it really makes sense that you have some uh, spare time to watch as many of these. Because there is always the opportunity to meet people and you can ask questions in the chats. If something in the more complicated talks uh, is interesting to you. And even for some of the recorded talks, we had uh, the speakers watching the chat and even answering questions there. So it does make sense to be at the event live. Um, okay, so I'll uh, take a quick 30 second break to remind you of uh, the company Microsoft uh, who are giving us a little bit, bit of money to make everything run fine here. And uh, then I'll be back and we'll prepare the uh, next. Okay, the video is, uh, is off, I'm on again. And uh, we have a few more minutes uh, before the next talk uh, starts that is scheduled. But uh, we have the speaker, Nitish, already waiting. So why not just put him on and uh, chat a little bit about this before we get started. Hey, welcome. Hey, hey, Martin. <laughs> it's, it's Glad, I'm glad to have you back. I think you were with us last year and you were also on EuroPython. Yeah. So you're an experienced pyjama speaker. <laughs> yeah, you could say that, yeah. <laughs> from 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 where are you dialing in? Where are you? Uh, so today? I'm based in Munich, Germany. Oh, nice. Yeah. It's so still... basically we're we're both in Germany and I'm at the top and you're at the bottom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, but I guess the weather is still like bad there. It's awful. Well, uh, and it's the perfect weekend for doing this pajamas because yeah. there's no reason to be outside. <laughs> okay, uh, you, you're today you're showing us uh, something with machine learning and databases. Yes. So is correct. is that your day? Is that your day job? Uh, I mean, I work as a uh, de developer advocate at Couchbase, which is a database company. So I was yeah. like, and we had like a new offering this year where we offer an option to run Python code inside your database. And so I said, yep. okay, let me just try something out. So the Python code is really running inside the database uh, nowadays. Yeah, yeah, you have the option. So it's kind of spike in the other way around. Yep. Now that that's that's actually a, a very interesting concept because in Germany we have all these data protection laws and if you run your queries on the server then the data never has to leave the server and I think that's a very convincing argument to say we have to do it for that reason alone. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, so how long have you been working with Python? We have another two minutes to kill, so let's let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, I think, yeah, so I started working with Python when I was in school, so like around 10 years ago. Okay. Yeah, maybe a bit more than that, but it was like just writing some scripts to uh, like do some automation stuff. But I mean, professionally, I think it started like, yeah, probably five, six years ago. Okay. And, and so you're working in Munich. So is there a, a big Python community? So if you are good with Python, is there good chances to, to, to get jobs or how's the situation there? Yes, definitely. You have a lot of options to work with Python in Munich. Like, yeah, mm. there are like lots of companies that use Python, especially on the web side and also data science. I mean, of course, Python is the major player there. So yeah. there are lots of options, yeah. Of course, like if you want to do machine learning, then you can't get uh, away from Python nowadays, which is great. But for other things, I can, uh, like in the north of Germany, uh, at some in some areas, Python is not that popular. So it's uh, it's getting better, but uh, it, they, they all come out of the holes. Like if you talk about Python, like on an event like this, everybody says, "Oh yeah, I love it too." But the companies themselves say, "Like no," and but that that was like a few years ago. So probably it's going to be uh, much much better for the people who, who do Python now. Yeah. And uh, I think that we're getting close to the scheduled time. So uh, everybody uh, who wanted to hear your talk and came in, came in late is not going to miss that. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm going to activate your screen share. Okay. So when you're ready, we have uh, three o'clock German time, two o'clock UTC. Uh, yeah. I invite you to get started. So have a great talk. Okay. Yeah. So hi, everyone. Uh, so as, Mart, as we discussed earlier, I'm Mitish and I work for Couchbase. And today in this talk, I'm going to talk, talk about how you can use machine learning inside your databases. Uh, and just a small info that I'm uh, accessible on Nitishar. I mean, this handle is ac available across most of uh, the social media platforms. Anyways, coming to today's talk, so I go a bit into the background of why, uh, background about uh, like machine learning in general, and also how these things are, how you are doing machine learning right now and how you could potentially do machine learning using the capabilities of your databases. And I'll also show you a demo using Couchbase. And in the end, I just say some of the use cases where this might be useful. Okay, uh, so my background is predominantly in data engineering. So I've worked like a lot with uh, data scientists, in building models that help solve business problems. Like you, uh, I would build like data pipelines that ingest data from different systems, do some aggregations, do some feature engineering, and then also work to, together with the data scientists in building a, prob a machine learning model that solves your problems. Uh, like to give you an example of some of the problems that uh, I've tackled in the past is things like dynamic pricing, where you are trying to balance the different elements in the system so that uh, the system is working in the most efficient way. Or there are other options like in an e-commerce setting, for example, you want to see when a package would arrive at your customer. Right now, I work as a developer advocate at Couchbase. Uh, in case you don't know what Couchbase is, Couchbase is essentially a document database and it is highly performant and uh, one of the bit, uh, most interesting aspects about Couchbase is that it offers Nickel, which is quite similar to SQL. So you can use SQL to query your document databases. Uh, and as I said earlier, this, this year we launched an option where you can run Python code in your database or in Couchbase. But this talk is not just uh, related to Couchbase. So you, I also explore some of the other machine learning capabilities in other common databases like SQL Server or BigQuery. Uh, so the main goal of machine learning is to en enable companies or businesses to e extract meaningful insights from the data that they have about their customers. It could be to solve business problems like offering personalized uh, recommendations to users or uh, figuring out anomalies in the system like for example, there could be fraudulent transactions that are flagged automatically in the system 
or you could also use this to uh, get more customer satisfaction. Let's say you have customers who might be not happy with the uh, website for some reason, and then you offer them an incentive which helps them uh, improve their satisfaction. But these are just some of the examples. There are lots more. So what I've seen commonly used to uh, build machine learning models and use them in production is to you start with getting your training data, which is typically coming from your transactional databases. Then you do some feature engineering uh, where you uh, kind of smoothen this data and make it better suited for the machine learning models that you are using. And then you build your model, uh, which is typically done by data scientists. And then after that, you deploy this model into uh, typically a, like a small microservice. Yeah. And then this microservice is called by the applications that need to uh, use the machine learning capabilities. And if you look at this, uh, like this training data, you can actually get this training data directly from transactional databases. Uh, however, if you do that, typically these uh, machine learning workloads take up, uh, are not short running processes. So they take a lot of uh, time to finish and you lose, and if you cannot generally do that on your transactional databases without affecting your uh, database or application performance. So what you tend to do is you build some ETL jobs, uh, which is extracting this data from transactional databases and putting it into an uh, alternative data store. And you also combine the feature engineering with this step, especially for the training phase. And after you are done with the training phase, you tend to uh, basically save this model and package this into a microservice like uh, using something simple like Flask or uh, Fast API. And uh, yeah, these, uh, these models are then exposed to our applications using a REST interface. Uh, I mean, this process works quite well and is quite standard in the industry. And you can also scale each of the individual services independently. However, one of some of the issues that I've seen with this approach is that you end up with like data duplication, like your transactional database and your uh, training data tends to diverge over time. Especially, this is especially the case if you have data scientists who don't work on the data ingestion or data uh, pipelines. And these uh, ETL jobs are also not trivial to manage, especially if you have a lot of data or if there is, uh, if there is like a, uh, you need to handle the faults or like failures in this ETL jobs. Another issue with this is how do you update these data or models? Typically what I've seen is you have some kind of REST interfaces where you upload a model or you just manually change this model by uploading a new model. However, this thing is mostly done manually and it's not that easy to keep track of the changes. There are a lot of solutions that try to solve this problem. I mean, there are lots of open source projects and even commercial projects. Uh, so this year, as I mentioned earlier, like Couchbase had this opportunity or like launched this feature where you can run Python code inside your database. And I was like, okay, let's see what are the options that are there if I want to run a machine learning model inside database. Uh, typically all of these approaches, they do an inference using SQL statements. And there are like uh, three different approaches that I've seen commonly. So one is you have built-in machine learning models inside the database, like for example, things like uh, Google BigQuery or Amazon Redshift. So they have machine learning models that are part of the database that you can just import and use like a library. But then there are options like third party integrations to existing databases, uh, like MindsDB, which emulates the existing database, but also uh, adds the machine learning capabilities to it. Then you also have an option to create your own custom machine learning models. Uh, these are typically done in Python or R and the most, and this is supported by a lot of server uh, databases like SQL Server, Oracle, Firebase, etc. 
coming uh, like a bit more into the built-in machine learning methods. So on the image on the right, you can see all the different models that are supported by BigQuery. So you can see that most of the common models are there, like linear regression or logistic regression, matrix factorization, even some deep learning uh, like algorithms. And uh, what BigQuery allows you to do is, it allows you to take any of these uh, methods out of the box. So you can say create model, linear regression, and you can specify some parameters, and you can also specify the data from your tables that you want to use in it. And, the out, and when you want to do an inference, it's select model and you specify the inputs to get your inference. Uh, yeah. And coming to the third party additions, like what, one of the most common is the MindsDB project. What they do is quite interesting. So it allows you to use any of your existing databases and including all the functionality. And on top of it, they provide you the functionality to create a a uh, predictor which is working on the underlying data. Like, for example, your SQL server or MySQL data. And yeah, here again, you have a SQL statement to do an inference. Coming to the custom machine learning methods, here you have support to import your custom code or custom models written by you in Python or R. Those are the most common languages. And here the workflow is you typically start with building the model on your developer machine, and then you package the model, and then you create a custom procedure in the database or like a stored procedure, and then you would call the stored procedure for your inference. Uh, one thing to highlight here is that this packaging and creating custom procedure can vary according to different databases. Like for example, in SQL Server, you have uh, these Python code, which is mixed into C, uh, the T SQL statements to create this uh, procedure. But on the other languages, uh, sorry, on the other databases, you have different approaches. I would say to summarize this, it's like you have uh, a wide variety of flexibility and uh, explainability options depending on your target audience. Like for example, this built-in machine learning and third-party integrations are meant for more data analysts or data engineers, whereas the custom machine learning uh, methods are more uh, aimed, targeted at the data scientists. Uh, however, if you look at them overall, like if most of the out-of-the-box models, they provide a good result, especially when you start out uh, building machine learning models. And you can also reduce your retail jobs because the, your database is now your single source of truth. And in most of these cases, it's also easy to upgrade these models because it's just redefining the function or just doing a, a recreating of the machine learning model. And you also don't typically need an external microservice for model survey. Uh, on the, some of the drawbacks could be that it's not that flexible, especially if you take some of the out of the box models. And one thing which you should ensure is that you should ensure the performance meets your requirements of the app. Like sometimes the database might not be as performant as your microservice could be. So this is something to keep in mind. So with that, I would just like to uh, give you a demo of how this works in Couchbase. Uh, so in Couchbase, we use custom machine learning code. Uh, so it's part of something called analytic service. So essentially analytic service is a real time uh, copy of your transactional data. So you can have an analytic service running on one node of your uh, cluster. And what this does is whatever data that you have stored in your uh, data service or your normal database is getting copied in real time to the analytic service. And it's also a massively parallel processing architecture. So meaning your data it, so whichever service is running the analytic service, whichever node that is running the analytic service works on the data that is present on that node. And we call it custom user-defined functions in Python. And you can do the inference in, using SQL statements. Uh, for this demo, what I would like to show is like a simple data set, uh, insurance codes, which is coming from uh, Kaggle. So you do custom, codes for your insurance based on lifestyle habits. 
So you have thing features like age, gender, body mass index, uh, smoking, etc. And all the customer can get real time in uh, codes for their inputs. Uh, so the steps to follow to create like these uh, machine learning model inside Couchbase is you start with training the model in Python locally, and then you would package this model into a uh, library, and then you would deploy this library to Couchbase Analytics, and then after that you would create a uh, function to use this Python library, and yeah, your SQL statements can then uh, inference this, can call this user-defined function. Uh, I'd just like to show you how it works. Uh, so right now, this is, uh, okay, before I uh, go through the code, let me just try to uh, package this code and also deploy this so that we don't lose a lot of time while I am explaining this. So you can see that this is a simple model. So it's only reading the data and doing a, a split of test and training sets. And then you have like uh, encode, you are encoding these categorical features into numbers because this is a regression model and it expects numbers. And then you have the regression model, which is a random forest regressor here. And you can also specify the parameters for the model. And yeah, I'm just fitting the model based on the training and testing data. And so you can see this is the uh, data set that I'm using. So you have age, gender, BMI, and all other features. And charges is what we are using for our uh, fitting the model. And in the end, I'm just dumping them or dumping the model into a file using pickle. And this is like the library that, which I've created, which is referencing the model. So it's loading the model. And then there is a function get prediction, uh, which is just used to predict the uh, insurance code for the user based on all these parameters that I've specified. So what I've done right now is I packaged this into a, a self-containing file uh, with all the uh, dependencies for this model. And I've also copied this into my uh, Docker container running the database. So let's go to the Docker container and let's look at the thing. So you can see that there's a file that I just uh, modified. So now what I'll do is I'll deploy this fun, uh, library into Couchbase. Uh, yeah, so this interface is right now uh, under, like right now mostly based for like admin users, but over time I expect this to be part of the web console. Uh, yeah, it takes a couple of minutes uh, for this function to be, or for this library to be uploaded to Couchbase. Uh, but what we are doing essentially is like uh, using the REST interface to upload the mo model that we just created onto Couchbase. Yeah, and this pipeline.pyz file has all the dependencies that is needed to run this code. Okay, so now we have uploaded the uh, library. So now let's go to the Couchbase console. Uh, okay, so let me just see what are the libraries that we have available. So you can see that some, I just uploaded an insurance code library. So now we can use, uh, we can create the function. So I'm just reusing the same thing that I had before. Uh, so what you see here is like the, I'm creating an existing function. Uh, so that's why the creator replaced, but essentially I'm creating an analytics function, which is the custom procedure, which is calling the Python machine learning model. So here it takes a number, text, number, number, text, text, and you are calling the model dot get prediction uh, method that we saw earlier in the Python code. So let me just go and execute this. Okay, so I just executed it. Now, if you look at this, uh, all the functions that are available in the cluster, you would see that we have the get insurance estimate. Now we'll be able to call the uh, call the inference. Let's see how it works for the inference. 
And here again, I'll just use an existing solution. So let's say I want to find the inference for five documents in my database. Oops. So here I have an, uh, this is, I is basically uh, the document that I'm getting from my data base. And also I'm providing the document along with it. I have the uh, user defined function that is calling the machine learning interface and I'm providing the age, gender, BMI, children, etc. So let's just run it. Yeah. Okay, so we saw that in seven seconds we have five records and for each of them we have a code. So here you can see that it's quite close to the actual charges, whereas in some cases it's not. But this is essentially down to training your model better or making it uh, or tuning the hyperparameters. Uh, similarly, if you want to just get, uh, let's say, raw data, I mean, if you want to do this for like just a user, you can also do that. So let's say we have an user at 25 years old, male with a BMI of 23, let's say, and no children and non-smoking uh, from, let's say, Northwest. Yeah, so this is like, okay, there was an interesting thing. Okay. Uh, okay, I think I missed something. Let's go back. Uh, okay, yeah. It's because the child is, yeah, of a different format. Yeah, so now you got a uh, code, which is $5,700. Yeah, uh, so coming back to the presentation, so we saw this demo now. And in this demo, what we did was we created a custom model in Python, and then we could run this in inference directly using uh, SQL statements. Uh, one thing which I didn't show here is that you can also run this using an SDK in all the different languages that are available, or you can also use a REST interface that Couchbase provides for it. And it's also really easy to update your model all that you need to do is train this model and upload it again. And you also don't need any microservices to deploy your machine learning model or run your run any ETL jobs to get a copy of the data. Uh, to conclude, I would say machine learning is getting more and more integrated into mo all the modern databases. And models are also getting more flexibility, like you can bring your own custom models to it. However, it might not be suitable for all use cases. Like for example, if you have a model that's working better with GPUs, in most cases, databases don't use GPUs. However, there are databases that support GPUs. So maybe that there's something you can explore. Uh, so when would this be a good thing to use? Like suppose you have a team where you don't have a lot of data scientists, uh, and some of the out of the box solutions work well for your business case. This might be something you can try with uh, the databases that provide uh, machine learning out of the box. Also, this can be something you can use to uh, simplify your model deployment workflows. Like it's just uh, a redeploying and re redefining the existing function at most. And you can also reduce your infrastructure, like reduce the ETL jobs and uh, machine learning microservices, which is less work for uh, everyone involved. Yeah. Uh, with this, I'm done with my uh, talk and you can contact me, like you can reach out to me at, uh, on Twitter or other sources. And the code is also available on my GitHub repository. Yeah, thanks. And if you have some questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, thank you very much for this. Um, uh, of course, like all the talks here, uh, this, this, this was a lot of information. So we will put the talk up uh, as a video so that you can watch it again and pause it and begin to understand how to do things. Um, 
If somebody uh, wanted to get into uh, this kind of topics, what do you recommend? How would you get started with with this topic? Uh, so one of the so if you want to get started with data science, I would say uh, it's better to try some of the Kaggle problems. So Kaggle has a lot of uh, open source uh, data sets and also real worked examples. So you can see how it works and you can also compare some of your solutions to how they work with uh, like somewhat the gurus have done, let's say. Mm. So how, how long did you uh, train to, to uh, be able to do your own uh, machine learning models? <laughs> uh, that's actually <laughs> an interesting question. I mean, the way I started was like, uh, I was working with uh, like as a part-time employee and then I was had like more senior people in the team and working with them, trying to learn, okay, some of the approaches that would work for different data sets and then working that way. But I've also worked a bit with Kaggle data sets, like working on some Kaggle competitions. That's mm. also fun. Yeah. Okay. Um, I Let's have a, a short look at this. Uh, I don't have any special questions here at the moment. Mm -hmm. So uh, you've posted your Twitter handle. Let's just show this once more. Uh, so maybe uh, if anybody uh, wants to get in contact with you and send questions directly, keep a note of this address or just go to the um, Pyjamas webpage where we'll sort you out and make sure that uh, the contact works. Yeah. So thank you again for being with us this year. And I really hope that we're going to meet you soon again. Yeah, thanks. See you later then. Bye. Bye. Okay, so uh, we have about two or three minutes of time left uh, in the chat. So they have reminded me that we should post the Discord link again. And so I will just uh, show this uh, here, hopefully quickly. Let's see if I can do that. Um, I think I might have promised too much, but I will post the uh, link as uh, soon as we have the next talk running in, in the YouTube chat. So uh, with another four minutes to go until we uh, start the next session, here's a brief word from our sponsor. back and and later on you will uh, have the uh, discord link in the chat where you can also then click on the microsoft channel and get a crypto thing for your crypto wallet if you have one of these if you don't have a crypto wallet yet and you want to play with this for the first time uh, there's also the option of just uh, sending them an email and then collect that later when you have set up one of these things um now, just before we come to the next speaker, who's already waiting and will be on the stage in a few seconds, uh, I can also tell you that you have the chance to be on pajamas yourself. If you have nice pajamas and you want to do a lightning talk, then on the pajamas website, there is a form where you can sign up to do one. Uh, I think it's around seven, um, so in about four hours. Um, we will sort that out later. So if you feel like speaking uh, at uh, this event for a few minutes, then uh, you can have a chance for that. So before we start with the uh, recorded talk from Paolo, let's have him on the stage to say hi. Hi, hi, hi everyone. <laughs> I'm, hi, I'm glad from, uh, from Italy. Sorry. You're calling from Italy. Yeah, I'm from Italy. So un un unlike uh, us here, you might have a nice day. <laughs> yeah, oh, here it is, uh, it's sunny. Uh, it's not so co so hot uh, outside, it's uh, 10 degrees, but it's, uh, it's sunny, so you can go around and have a walk. Uh, I, my, my pyjama is very <laughs> light. Yep. So because yeah, like 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 so like in the hot countries, you you can have a T-shirt as a pajama. That's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you not like here, you would have to wear a T-shirt under your pajama. Otherwise, you can't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. So uh, I'm, I have to get ready for uh, um, getting your talk. Uh, like I'll do it in, in a minute or so. But maybe uh, uh, we can talk a little bit about what you are going to show to us. It's about Django and Postgres. Is that correct? Yeah. The um, the talk is about Django and Postgres, and I I um, listed all the tricks or interesting things I I did in past year with Django and Postgres and uh, not the uh, most obvious things you can do, but the, the most interesting part, the fastest way to do some particular job or interesting thing you can do with it. And you can't imagine it's available for free. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it is, of course, it's always nice if you can have these databases and Django for free. And yeah. while, man, while many people have experience with Django, not everybody has used the Postgres database before. So that, that will be yeah. interesting. Um, this is one of these topics where you might get an audience where people have very specific questions. And uh, let me remind you all, there is a group, there's a YouTube chat where you can ask a question. And after the uh, recorded talk, we'll come back and maybe uh, be able to ask a question or two. So uh, do you think, should I start it right now? Yeah. Okay, so we, uh, we are, let's, let me check my clock. We are almost on time. So um, let's open the file and let's hope that we'll get this to play. Enjoy. Uh, and there it is. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here with you, even if remotely. In this talk, we'll see how to use some great feature of Postgres as a database in Django. In the database section of the Django documentation, we can read that Django attempts to support as many features as possible on all backends. However, not all database backends are alike. Django per se is a database agnostic web framework but unfortunately, real-world projects based on it are not. Postgres has the richest feature set of any Django-supported database, and we'll see in this talk how to use some of these superpowers. Before moving on, it's important that I make this clear. Okay, it seems clear to me. Now we can move on. Seriously, I would like to underline that I'm not a database administrator. So, who am I? I'm a Paolo Melchiorre and I'm the CTO of 20Tab, a Pythonic software company for which I work remotely. I'm a software engineer and a long-time Python backend developer. After using Django for a few years, I became a contributor to the project. I also use Postgres as a database for all my Django project. And I would say it's time to create one. As usual, to create a Django project, I use the latest Python 3 stable, create and activate a virtual env, in which then install the latest stable Django. In this case, Django 3.2.4, released yesterday. Then, using the Django start project command, I create the basic files of our project. And now, let's see what it takes to add Postgres to this newly created project. I think many of you are familiar with this drawing from the Little Prince. This drawing is used as the header of the Twitter account of PsychoPG, a Postgres driver for Python. I think it represents its goal very well, Python with Postgres inside. PsychoPG is the most used and advanced Postgres driver for Python. It implements the Python DB API 2.0 specification and it's distributed under the LGPL license. The library was released 20 years ago and over the time has been constantly improved and kept aligned with Postgres. Version 3 is currently being developed. PsychoPG is a, a wrapper for libpq, the Postgres C client library. To install this package on a Debian-based system, you can use the apt package manager. For other operating system, you can read specific instructions in the documentation. For most operating systems, the quickest way to install PsychoPG is using the package available in the Python package index. 
And now let's see how to use PsychoPG in Django. To use Postgres as a database in your Django project, we modify the setting adding this PsychoPG based database backend and the connection parameters of our Postgres database, which we may have locally or remotely. If you embrace the 12 factor methodology, you can define a database URL variable in your environment. Depending on whatever you use, Django database URL or Django configuration, your database section should look something like this. Let's now see our database in action. We we'll use the example model defined in the making queries section of the Django documentation. For our test queries, we only use an outer model and an entry model, both containing various type of field. We can search on. We can perform basic queries like these in our models, but actually, we can run these queries using all other supported databases as well. What you are, we are really interested in is using Postgres specific feature from Django. For this same reason, in 1214, Mark Temlin, a Django core developer, started a crowdfunding campaign to develop a module to contain fields for a number of Postgres specific data types. The campaign was successfully and the new module was merged in Django 1.8. The module now contains Postgres specific fields, indexes, function, extension, and so on. Over the years, important functions have been added such JSON fields, full text search, random UUID, and operator classes. JSON fields have become usable also in the other supported database, but only from Django 3.1, released last year, five years after being introduced in the Postgres module. To use all the functions of the Postgres module, just add it to the installed apps list in the setting file of our project. And now let's see, let's get to know some of the features of this module better. Okay, I took this photo during the spring day after the DjangoCon Europe 2017 in Florence. And in that day, I completed a pull request to add a database function in the Postgres module for Django 2.0. I was helped that day by Mark Tamley, the original creator of the Postgres module, and by Marcus Alterman, a Django core developer, both in this photo. The database function I'm talking about is random UUID. The random UUID database function returns a version 4 UUID. It's contained in the PG Crypto module that provides cryptographic functions for Postgres. It can be activated using the crypto extension migration operation. But from Postgres 13, this function is included in core. To see the function in action, we had a UUID field in our entry model. This field uses Python UUID class and only when used on Postgres, this store in a UUID data type. The database will not generate the UUID for you, so it's recommended to use default. But note that the UUID for callable is passed to default, not an instance of it. Using the random UUID function, you can update all UUD value in a model way faster than cycling over all the entries and generating a new value with the Python function. I recently used this technique to set in few seconds UUD in a nearly 1 million row table. Okay, I took this other photo during the sprint day after the Euro Python 2017 in Rimini. I promoted a working group on Django and some developer joined me. That day we started the transition of the Django project website search function from Elasticsearch to a Postgres full text search solution. Since then I've written an article and give more than one presentation on full text search with Django, so I skipped the implementation details 
but at the end of this talk you will find references to retrieve them. The full text search support in the Postgres module has specific fields, expression and function. If your Postgres version is recent enough, you can also use specific indexes, phrase searches and web search style. Without any customization, we are able to perform a full text search on a single field of the entry model. For example, we can search for a word in the plural form and have results in the singular form. This is a very convenient way to start using Postgres full text search out of the box. To speed up the full text search, we can add a search vector for the entry model and use it to create a functional gene index in the same model. The functional indexes are an addition of Django 3.2, available for all Django database backend, but gindex is only available in the Postgres backend. After that, we can search for a word using a syntax similar to the one used by search engines and have more accurate results. We can use these syntaxes using the search query with the search type attribute. Furthermore, the SQL queries will be faster thanks to the gene index. With this photo, we move virtually in the Northern Europe, more precisely in Norway. I took this photo because I really like the effect of these typical houses in the water, all similar to each other but repeated, like data in an array. The array field make Postgres array types available in Django. They are very convenient for storing arrays of similar data without creating a new model for them. You can specify other Django model fields as a basis. Its size can be defined or it can even be multidimensional. For example, we can store multiple emails in our author model by defining an emails array of email fields. We can then query our author looking for an email defined as a list. The content of the field itself is represented as an email list. And the resulting SQL code uses all Postgres specific operator, like in this example. Unfortunately, the default array field widget in the Django admin is a simple input text with a comma separated values. But using these Python packages, you can represent in the Django admin the values of the previously specified email fields as a multiple dynamically addable text input. I took this other photo in San Francisco. We are now virtually moving in California because the packages we are going to talk about is provided by the California Civic Data Coalition an open source network of journalists and computer programmers for news organizations across America. Django Postgres Copy is a Python package to quickly import and export the limited data with Django support for Postgres Copy command. The Copy command moves data between tables and standard file system files. Copy to co coops, copies the content of tables or the results of a select query to a file. Copy from copies data from a file to a table appending the data to whatever it is in the table already. To more flexibility, Django Postgres Copy uses a temporary table that are automatically dropped at the end of the session. To benchmark Postgres Copy, we use a CSV file containing all the geographic names from the OpenStreetMap project. We create a new model that maps each columns contained in the CSV file into a field. We have to replace the model default manager with the one from Postgres copy. Here we use the CSV file with all the geographical names of Italy. The file is more than 200 megabytes. To upload the CSV file, we use the appropriate query set method in which we indicate the path to the file. The loading is speed is impressive, almost 1 million records in just over 3 seconds. 
Under the hood, Django Postgres copy executes several SQL statements, creates a temporary table based on the content of this CSV file, upload the content of the CSV file to the temporary table in just over two seconds. It inserts the data of the temporary table into the table managed by the feature Django model, eventually applying transformation, and finally deletes the temporary table. To reduce disk space and transmission bandwidth, we have compressed our CSV file in gzip format, reducing the, the size to a fifth. We can pass our compressed file directly to Postgres copy without having to decompress it. Loading is even done in a slightly shorter time than measured with the compressed, the, the compressed CSV file. I want to repeat it, almost 1 million records in just over 3 seconds. We are now virtually moving in Italy with this photo I, that I took in Abud in Abruzzo, the region where I live. I'm showing you this photo because now we are going to talk about trees. Django L3 is a tree extension to support hierarchical tree-like data in Django models using the native Postgres extension L3. It's a simpler and faster alternative to implement materialized paths compared to more used Django packages. The package has a path field and an abstract tree model. To add tree-like hierarchy to the entry model, we add a path field inheriting from the tree model provided by Django L3. We also add a dedicated Postgres GS index on the same field to speed up queries. This is a tree representation of the example hierarchical structure that we have stored in the path field of our model. I took this example from the Postgres L3 documentation. We perform a hierarchical query to filter all the contained models of a particular path, sort the result by the tree structure, and then take all the sub-paths. The resulting SQL statement uses the L3 operator to filter the table and the gist index to speed up the operation and the sorting. With this photo, we are now virtually moving on the path of my last hike on the Italian Apennines. I already used this photo in my recent talk about maps with Django, which you can read on my blog, but I want to briefly talk about the geographical extension of Postgres used by GeoDjango. PostGIS is a Postgres extension and it's also the best database backend for GeoDjango. It, internally, integrates special data and has a special data types, indexes, and functions. In this chart, I synthesize the compatibility table of the geographic backends supported by GeoDjango. In the GeoDjango documentation, there are three compatibility tables for special lookups, database function, and aggregate function. As you can see, PostGIS is the only geographical backend that supports 100% of the feature. If you are interested in using this feature, you can see my previous talk. There are also many other Postgres-specific features that can be used directly in Django. For example, you can use a lot of indexes and aggregation functions only available in Postgres. You can also use the Trigram extension to perform fast searching for similar string. There are also specific fields only available in Postgres, like range fields and case insensitive text fields, and more. Before saying goodbye, I want to share with you some tips based on my experience as a Postgres user with Django. Reading the documentation in the Django website is full of information about the Postgres module. Read the details about this feature in the Postgres website. It's help you to understand how things work under the hood. Read the source code of both project in GitHub because there is something you can learn only from the code. 
Search also for questions on Stack Overflow, but try to ask for a question by yourself instead of reading answer. Last but not least, you can also study this talk because it is released with a Creative Commons license. The Psycho PG3 library is under active development and you can use this contact to learn more about it, get involved and also sponsor its development. The company work for 20 tab <coughs> is one of the sponsors of this library. In 20 tab we have developed many Django projects using Postgres. You can find more about our open source project and our Potonic works using these contacts. To find, more, to find out more about my personal work with Django and Postgres, use all my contacts. Using this QR code, you can download this presentation on my website. <clears throat> Thanks again for having me. Enjoy the next talk in the conference. Ciao a tutti. Hi. The good thing is that, hey, uh, you should not now be able to hear me. Uh, when I'm on mute, I can still hear you. <laughs> but thanks for typing. Okay, let's let's get back to this. So, uh, well, I, I have to thank you for uh, your talk that you condensed this into 20 minutes so that uh, somebody who's working in the field of Django but has not done anything with Postgres um, may have the information concentrated and an argument for taking a look at this. Um, yeah. I. Yes, uh, I think it's quite interesting uh, to see that all these functions for geographical um, access or for mapping are included. So um, what exciting things have you been doing with this? Yes, I um, I read some article about uh, using GeoDjango and PostGIS because uh, working on it in projects uh, in 20 tab has Every time I discover a new credible feature you can use, and they are uh, there for free, you can use them and uh, start doing all from basic um, steps uh, with maps uh, to more complicated uh, maps with million records. And uh, they work out of the box with the standards like GeoJunk in GeoJSON and similar. So uh, I wrote this article starting from the basic uh, with Django and SQLite and then using all the feature of PostGIS and Leaflet. It's the ah, framework, JavaScript framework you can use for doing maps and also Django REST framework to interact between the your map and your Django application using your REST full uh, uh, API and you can write your endpoint very easily using only the the package um, and it's very uh, convenient uh, also interesting uh, I'm not a full full stack developer I use only few HTML and JavaScript but with uh, leaflet it's very simple also for people like me to develop a very good map and store your, your points or have track of your um, place in the world where yeah. you have been. Yeah, for, for, for my use case, I'm working for booking systems for, for shipping companies and we use Leaflet to move the little ships. So if a customer goes onto the website, then they can see where the ships are. Uh, but I, I was impressed that you showed that you could import like a million data lines in a very short time. Uh, does yeah. that also apply that you could show these points in a very short time so that you could convert them quickly to something on a map or is Leaflet not the right solution for that? Yeah, so that was a very, very incredible. I was shocked the first time I saw it. 
because I tried uh, cycling over a file with data in it, points or other things, and cycling on it in, in Python is very slow. Uh, instead, if you can uh, use the, um, the function of uh, Postgres to load directly the data, the row, uh, the line in the file, directly in the database, and also um, doing some transformation on it. And also, it's, I think it's the best part, directly from the a compressed file. So you don't need to uh, decompress it uh, and have a lot of memory occupied to do this job. But very quickly, you can uh, bring this data on your database and start working on it, querying with your models. And it's very, very convenient. I use it in every book. Is it also quick to get the data out again? So yeah, if you yeah. want, and directly into compressed files, is it the same? Yeah, yeah. You can uh, redirect the, um, uh, the stream of data in a plain file or in a compressed file and something you can use because also because in Python, you still have a, a module in the standard library to interact with gzip or bzip2 or also um, other other compressed formats. So everything is transparent and uh, easy to use. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's the, one of the uh, most important things that you can have quick ways of getting data in and out out of system. At least when you want to connect this maybe to other non Postgres databases, because you uh, might might use that database for your web service, but then have a company specific database that you cannot touch, and you're forced to use some other formats. Um, have. Have you had have you had to play with this, some sort of things like connecting this to other databases as well, or is uh, that not? Yeah, good? unfortunately, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, every every time is a, is a bit uh, complicated to interact with database made for other framework or for other environment or concept. But um, I. I used uh, sometimes the, the feature of Django to inspect the database and automatically create models to interact with uh, this the database, also avoiding uh, to modify it. For example, mm -hmm. when you, you have to read data from another database uh, and doing some queries but not modifying anything, you can do it very easily. and. Also, um, extracting data and uh, importing in Postgres is very easy with Django Postgres copy because it's it's very fast. So you can um, you can stop querying on the other database, extracting all the data, and then in a few seconds you can start uh, using on your database because you know it, how it works. You can do it very fast in a faster way. Yeah, that's very tempting. Uh, thanks for taking the time to show us all of this and for, show, for showing up uh, uh, from your warm pajama place. <laughs> <John>. <laughs> and I, I hope to meet you in person at some of the other conferences again, because it has yeah. been a long time that we could just meet in places like Rimini, which was a lot of fun. Yeah, I hope so. We are organizing the Py Python Italia uh, conference in June, so I hope also other people will show up there in person. Finally, we can have a beer together and chat about our talks and our uh, interesting yeah. topics. Uh, I, I, I looked at that and checked, like, is there a train from Germany to, to reach that conference? Yeah. Thanks but, again for having me here and for your work in this conference. I yeah. really appreciate it. Okay, so thanks, Bye. thanks, and uh, I hope to see you next year. Bye. Okay, and we are halfway done with this second block uh, of uh, this day of pajama talks, but there's much more to come because we are actually doing this until eight o'clock UTC tomorrow morning. I have no idea how we're going to make this, but it's 
will have to work because we've done this for two years and this year it will also work. And one of the reasons why this does work is we have uh, a few great volunteers who help out with this, like Choke who opened the, the conference and uh, we had Jacob already doing things. And later on, uh, we'll also have Jason from America who's going to take uh, um, uh, work at a time where uh, we might already be a little bit too tired. Um, and this uh, last talk was uh, web related because it was Django, but there is not only Django, but there is uh, also other frameworks which are popular. And the big competitor of Django is Flask. But there is a third one that is coming up and uh, getting a lot of glory, and that's Fast API. And that's going to be our next topic after this very short reminder that Microsoft is helpful in sponsoring this conference. And after that short clip that we needed to just organize ourselves here, uh, I welcome our next speaker, uh, Yasser Tahiri. Hello. Uh, hello, Martin. How are you? Oh, I'm, f I'm fine. I'm great. We're having a lot of fun today organizing yeah. this. It, it, it's always chaotic, but well, <laughs> that's that's what you get when you have these fun volunteer run things that we all run on our personal hardware and um, it was really interesting and I'm amazed that after half a year of work, we managed to fill another day of talks with a very wide spectrum from beginners to very specific topics. And I, I really like fast APIs, so I'm really looking forward to what you are going to show to us. And maybe you can convince people who have not tried it to have a look. So, uh, do you want to take some questions after the talk? Or, uh, uh, yes, of course. Let's... Yes, of so course. If, so if there's any questions uh, for those people who are watching live on YouTube, just post these into the chat. If there's something, then I'll ask this at the end. But uh, at the moment, I'm going to go away so that you can uh, show us something about Fast API. Yeah. OK, uh, good morning, everyone. And hello to everyone. Uh, glad to be here with you in Pyjamas conference. So uh, this is my first time in here as Pyjamas. I will present a new framework, a new white framework with a large community coming up uh, next year uh, called FastAPI. It will help us uh, create a backend or uh, multiple APIs uh, in a modern way based on Python 3.6 and up. So uh, let's start. Uh, who am I? I'm an, an experienced backend developer from Morocco, uh, also an, uh, an open source developer, mostly self-taught and uh, passionate about Python, about uh, backend development, about uh, uh, serving APIs and everything related to, to working in the backend side. Uh, I work for a startup uh, called Obites. Also, uh, I lead a community called the uh, BOF. Uh, for that, I reward some uh, some uh, communities of Fast API and people by working on some uh, some uh, projects like uh, AutX for authentication, uh, Fast API class, Fast API, Fast API lazy to generate uh, a pre-built project. Uh, so let's start. Our agenda is going to be like this: uh, we're going to study what is Fast API, uh, Fast API based on what, uh, magic of Fast API, uh, little like uh, frequent questions. And uh, a little comparing between three, uh, the three frameworks with a simple demo at the end and some resources, also the pre-built packages that's, uh, that are shared uh, widely. So let's start. <clears throat> uh, what is FastAPI? FastAPI is a modern, fast, high-performance framework. Uh, 
for building APIs with Python 3.6 based on FASTAP of on standard Python type. So this is Sebastian. Uh, he's the creator of uh, Fast API. Uh, I work in a large way uh, on the machine learning and everything related to, to building APIs on this. Uh, so what? why Fast API is special? Uh, mostly because uh, Fast API is based on two things. Based on pedantic uh, type hinting model and data validation and Starlet and ASCII framework. And uh, there is some, some, some parts of Fast API that are great. Uh, for example, is a fast framework. Uh, how we see uh, why they do some 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 uh, benchmarks like with Jeng, with Node.js, with the Go, with other frameworks that in other languages. So they found that it is very uh, it's very performance and high. Uh, fast to code uh, could increase the uh, speed of developer. Also, uh, fewer bugs, like reduce about uh, 40, uh, for, uh, 40 of human uh, bu uh, development bugs. Also, it's easy. We code small. We code the shortest code and get uh, a lot, a lot of features. And uh, the most important thing is robots. Like uh, we got the pro in the production ready, so the code is gonna be ready in production fast. Um, this is what we just said, fast run. It's offer a very high performance on pair with the uh, Node.js and Go, thanks to Starlet and Pedantic, because uh, if you check the documentation of Starlet or Pedantic, you will find that, that they are also have a good benchmark and a good uh, a high speed to run it. Uh, we have also the fast code. As we said, it's a lot for a significant increase in development speed, uh, reduce the number of bugs, it's reduced the possibility for human uh, induced error. Initiative, it's offer a great editor support. Like uh, I guess last uh, last three days, they they just ran out in a new updates in at push arm, and they add a lot of features related to Fast API. Uh, based on a tweet or a, on a post by Sebastian about it, so I just read it. Uh, straightforward. It's designed to be uncomplicated uh, to use and learn. So you can uh, spend less time reading documentation. As you can see, we can take a simple look on uh, the documentation, how it's be, like, how is the documentation of SAPI? It's built by MKDoc. Uh, MKDoc, I like this team. I like this team so, so much. Like, uh, it's, a, it's a good team to use, to use for build uh, your, uh, your documentation based on the uh, uh, MKDoc. So a simple documentation and, uh, could help us to create a high level, like uh, high level uh, APIs. <clears throat> Short, as we said, it's been uh, it's minimized code duplicated, a robotist and standard based. So it's uh, based uh, on uh, on open standards for APIs, open API and, G and JSON schema. So let's study some some three points. How fast API based on what? On why I will choose fast API uh, maybe over some other frameworks. Uh, we have Pedantic and Starlet and the ASCII. Maybe this could be both, but we will study here the case of every core when we run uh, our our fast API projects. So Pedantic is a data validation and setting management using Python type annotation. Uh, how we said pedantic is a new it's not new or something like that it's been here for more than two years i guess one years uh it's helped to 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 code a data validation in a fast way uh python type annotation <clears throat> with a lot of a lot of a uh, lot of uh, features that could help us build our models and uh, fix our sh uh, schema so it's fast as we said first, it's helped by uh, Fast API to be one of the fastest frameworks. Uh, also, validates complex structures. Uh, we're gonna see in the demo some a structure of, of how we could build our models and uh, validate our scheme, our schema. Uh, extensible, we could add, for example, other validators and decor uh, decorators. So it's not uh, only only just playing around the the features that Pedantic offer. But we could add our uh, our extensions and or our uh, features. Uh, Starlet Starlet is a lightweight uh, ASCII framework. 
asynchronized server gateway interface uh, help, uh, build, uh, help us to build a high performance asynchro servers and uh, and that's more like how we said uh, if if we said fast API we could set starlet because uh, I think more than 90 much percent of uh, features in fast API are based on starlet so how we said it supports web sockets it supports uh, asynchro uh, services uh, it supports a lot of uh, a lot of features like uh, test clients with requests, uh, the cores, GZIP, the static files, streaming process, streaming response, and uh, also for the, the authentication and authorization, it supports sessions and uh, and uh, cookies. So that's why uh, Starlets it could be a good fit for uh, for Fast API. And at the end, to run our project or to run our uh, fast API server, we use Avicorn or Hypercorn. There is also a lot of uh, a lot of uh, provider like that. So uh, we use an asynchronized server gateway interface. It's a spiritual success for to Whiskey. Uh, intended provide a standard interface between async capable Python web server framework and application. Uh, how we said we have two terms here, like we could use term sync. Uh, so we call sync a server use the the underlying operating system support of tweets and processing to implement the concurrency uh how we said like client 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 we said we, we send a request to the web server and the web server creates a, a lot of process of a service worker so that's why we mean this this uh, the term of sync but the term of async is an asynchronized is an asynchronized of uh uh, we mean by asynchronized term is the server that's run a single process that is controlled by a loop. So we, in the, when we said async, we talk about quarantines and the event loop. Uh, both in JavaScript and Python is the same one. Uh, the loop is very effic uh, efficacious, efficient, like uh, task manager and the schedule uh, that creates tasks to execute the requests that are sent by the client. Uh, unlike server worker, which are long lived and assigned task uh, is what is creates the loop handle to specific request. So it's not like the the, uh, the sync way, the synchronized way. It's not creating uh, like uh, in every uh, when we send a request, we create a, lo a load balance. Then uh, we send uh, a lot of service worker. We, here we create like the client send the request. We create an event loop and the event loop. The, uh, so that is a task, like everything is this in a task and this is a loop. That's that's the uh, title of this. Uh, this is last thing. This is my uh, my tweet. The more I use FastAPI, the more I love it because I call a lot of FastAPI uh, during the time in the part time or in the open, open source uh, sites. As we said, this is the magical part, async await, type hints and models. Maybe this is the magical part of the modern Python. That, uh, what we mean by the modern Python is uh, all what supports in uh, 3.6 and up. So the models, how we said pedantic, allow, custom, uh, allow us to custom the data type to be definite or, or you can extend the validation methods uh, with methods and uh, on a model decorator or uh, the validator decorator. So how we said it before, like uh, I see before, pedantic help us to customize a lot of things. Uh, async await. As you see, the term of async await based in Starlet and how we run our project using Avicorn is uh, uh, how we introduce it in async def, async function, introduce either a native quarantineous or an asynchronized generator. The type hint formal uh, solution to statically in, uh, indicate the type of a value within your Python code. Uh, we'll see how we do the type hint and uh, how that's help us to make our models more shorter and um, Uh, here is some pre-asking questions, like uh, people mostly gonna ask. I will uh, help here to to get and and understand them. Uh, how I said uh, pre-asking questions. How do you run a fast API? Like always interface or or API's interface. Fast API is called from your code. It's offer features such as a type hints for data passed in dependency injection and authentication so that you don't have to write your own functions yeah like uh, 
Oh, we said there is a pre-built functions in the fast API code that's just within the documentation. You could use it, use these functions to create your REST API or your API. And uh, how to run it? We create an instance called fast based on fast API. That's we run our project. Uh, is fast API production ready? As I see in the benchmark of, of uh, if we see like the benchmark of some some um, uh, big uh, big products or something like that, uh, uh, there is some testimonial in the the in the official documentation that show that Microsoft, Netflix, and other big companies use Fast API in some microservices or in some uh, REST APIs. I guess in the official documentation we will find it in the opinion or yeah, opinion. For example, this is Gabriel Khan is a maybe a developer in Microsoft. He used Fast API in a ton in the machine learning services of Microsoft. Uh, at Uber also, we they adopt Fast API to spawn a REST server. Uh, Netflix also uh, crisis management orchestration framework. Uh, this is Python Bytes uh, podcast. So maybe Fast API is, re is a production ready while it's an open source framework and uh, how they said it's a fully production ready with an excellent documentation support and easy to use interface. Uh, is uh, Python a good language for implementation and API interface? Uh, mostly this is the most question that, that we ask uh, while working, for example, in a startup, in a company, and we adopt a new project or a new product. We have uh, how we will build our APIs or how we will serve our backend. So this is, this is uh, what you said, the hard part to, 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 get, to, to, get, the, to get the things more clear. Okay, sorry, can I interrupt you for a short uh, question? We have some problems with the video. It seems that your webcam and your slides have frozen. We can still hear you, but uh, we are on the magical page with model, async, await, and type hint, and okay. it's not moving anymore. So maybe uh, I can remove your screen and you shot, as you start the screen share again. Uh, maybe that helps. Okay. Oops. Uh, what about now? We have the same screen. Oh, now we have pre asking questions. So we have something okay. else. Uh, your webcam is also frozen. So maybe we can also try to get the camera working again. Now? Nope. So, oh, yes, something is happening. Uh, move your head a little bit. Uh, we we got a different frozen picture. Oh well, this is this is what happens if you do things live. Uh, that's the fun of it. Because um, <laughs> how how boring would it be if everything would be um, correct? Maybe so, maybe I could I could stop the camera and only use the slides. Yeah, makes sense. I'll just take the camera off uh, and take myself off as well. Uh, from that point on, uh, you will not be able to hear me anymore. And we'll just see if the slides move when you go to the next one. Okay, that seems to have worked, but taking the camera off might have just also turned off your microphone. So <laughs> this is the, the good question is, is fast API production ready? I would totally say it is. If StreamYard is put um, production ready, well, <laughs> sometimes these things break. Um, but we are working on this. So basically, uh, I think uh, the easiest way is if you would just leave, if you can hear me, if you would just leave the studio and come back again, because that normally resets things. And here I am alone, so um, this is probably what was chosen. The good thing is uh, I have now some time to say more nice things about the people who sponsor us. And just quickly to say that it's not only um, Microsoft is also Pack Publishing, uh, who in some kind of raffle we will later uh, try to give some uh, books away. So, and the camera is moving again, and I hope I can hear you too. Finally. <laughs> oh, great. No, it's great. Yeah. So okay. this, this, well, this, these are the things that happen. Well, uh, people expect that you can talk to anybody 
around the world with moving picture and screen share. Uh, this is actually a dream come true and it's uh, <laughs> impossible that this is actually working. So um, maybe you can just go uh, back to this part and we'll just cut this out when we'll put the video online. <laughs> uh, okay. okay, I'll go. Okay, uh, how I said, like, uh, uh, I guess we was in the fast API project ready. As I said, Fast API uh, use it in some big company and some big techs like uh, uh, Microsoft and uh, Uber, Netflix. Also, they give a good opinion about uh, Fast API that they use it in a service like uh, machine learning service or the the, the the side of microservices service. So um, the next question is: Python a good language for implement an API interface? As I said. The big problem here is the, the, this is the big questions. Uh, always when we, we start a project or we adopt a new project, we have a question: Are we gonna use Python, JavaScript, uh, Ruby, uh, Go, Rust? What language we will use? So, for example, when we use Python, we said, "What is the framework that will serve all the functionality that uh, help us to build the most most of things in this project?" Then. The most of questions parts in Django, uh, Flask, Fast API. So all of the three parts play around it. So how I said, it can be fit. It can be the interface is well defined and the underlying code has been optimized. The documentation claim that Fast API, Fast API perform as well as Node.js and Go. So in the side of performance, uh, we can use Python, we can use Fast API, we can use Django also, we can use Flask to serve our uh, our uh, projects or to implement our back in a, in our backend uh, so the next part going to be uh, a little comparing between django flask and fast api uh, so don't take it wrong in a way uh, what i mean is taking taking for 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 comparing things community performance Flexibility and packages. Uh, what I mean by packages, most of people where they create package, where they serve an open source project based on what, based on uh, they create what. So this is what I mean by packages. Community, how we see the community, uh, Stack Overflow, the technical blogs, the technical uh, uh, forums, where we see like that. Performance, based on um, like the performance in web, uh, an article about how performance, performance in some videos, performance in some in some uh, real life projects, also the flexibility like the developer experience. As we said, packages, Django, uh, how I mean, it's gonna win. I have more than a thousand package uh, and libraries. Maybe we can say the big project of Django is Django is framework. So boats are uh, uh, provide a lot of functionalities and uh, things. That's why. Django gonna win him uh, in this, which can be considered as the full stack web development framework. Flask is a, is a micro framework, and Fast API has a has a lower packages than Django. Right now, uh, Fast API I have more, maybe a hundred package or a hand two hundred, not 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 a lot, not a lot uh, packages. Uh, in the community side, since there is a variety of use of Django framework and Django packages, uh, maybe we can say that it has been realized earlier that Flask and Fast API. So it's have a, lo a large side community among of this framework. In the performance side, how is it first? Fast API uh, comparing with Node.js and Go in the performance. So uh, we can say that this is the fastest framework uh, in the Python side or in the Python language. A Flask also is a high performance, but it's a micro framework, so it doesn't give uh, a lot of uh, a lot of functionalities in a way. Uh, Django maybe slow, slowly in, the, in this way. Flexibility. Uh, last time uh, the, the the Stack Overflow survey showed that one of the more loved the framework is the uh, Fast API. So Maybe while developing uh, developing an application with the focus of the development on the flexibility, maybe Fast API gonna win and Flask because uh, we code shorter and we got a lot of features 
uh, more than Django that we call our settings, our view, our models, our uh, uh, URLs, our all of the basics. So this is a simple comparison. Now we will run a simple demo. Uh, let's run a pre-built package. We need we will create a simple blog using Fast API. So we will find the link here in my uh, GitHub account. I will share the screen. So you see, uh, so this is the the link. I will share it in the studio part. Uh, this is a, an API, Dodge API, uh, just in the name. Uh, an API that's a high performance to create a simple blog with authentication. I write also a simple blog about it, how it's created, how it's that. I define also a getting start, how to, to stop the project, how to create the environment. You could also run in this part of Do using Docker. So I have the project locally, so we could uh, use it locally. So I will try code. Let's open the VS code. Uh, how you see, this is maybe the uh, simple structure of the first API project. This is just a simple structure of first API project. And it seems that uh, this is a bit too simple at the moment because the video has frozen again. Uh, if you can hear us, then <laughs> just uh, try to uh, connect, reconnect and connect once more and then we can continue with this because this uh, looks at the moment like a blank uh, screen from uh, um, Visual Studio Code, I guess. And let's let's. Ch I'm going to check through the other channel. Uh, they, okay, that looks that looks like a uh, an attempt to reconnect. And as this has worked before, I'm pretty sure it will come back <laughs> in a minute or two. Um, during the last outage, I was just telling you about that um, we have also a sponsorship from Pact. And if I'm not 100% mistaken, uh, we will raffle away some voucher for books or ebooks later. And the other members of the team will have the information about that. The other thing you should be knowing about is if you would like to um, be able to talk at this conference, uh, we have lightning talks. And at the pajamas, um, a site you can uh, click a link to the uh, lightning talk form and then sign up to get your five minutes of fame uh, here and i see yes is coming back and hello hello again i don't yeah. know what's happening here but i guess this um, is a connection issue or something like that. yeah I, th I think things are freezing outside here in germany and i think in morocco where you are maybe the internet is just freezing i don't know <laughs> <laughs> but we want we want to see your example. We were uh, uh, when we lost you. You were showing the title screen of an editor like Visual Studio Code. Yeah. Uh, if you Thank have you. a if you have a chance, maybe try to make the font a little bit bigger so that people can read it. Okay. Now it's good. Now it's much better. Thank you. And I'm okay. going to go away and hope that the rest of the presentation works. Uh, so I, how I said first, the, uh, this is a schema of a project of SAPI. Here, this is the models that I said first we create with the, with Escolar Shimi to create our our database models. First, we have the block. We have uh, here uh, the ID, the title, the body, the user ID, the creator. We have also the user the class user where we use the table name, user ID name, email, password, and the blocks. It's a relationship between creator and the blog. Uh, all of this is uh, built with the uh, using SQLR uh, So don't get it wrong. We only create an instance of base. Here we, decla we declare our session and uh, create our uh, database uh, using SQLR uh, 
so this is the, the the schema that I want to show you built with the with the Pedantic. So we use the type in the type in module to to ensure the list and uh, ensure the optional one. So Pedantic, we use the base module in Pedantic to create a block base. We give the title a string, a body a string. Here we create the block, the block base, pass it on this. We give the, uh, the configuration of the ORM mode. We give here true. We create also the user, uh, the name, the email, the password as a string format. And we give here the show user, when you will show the user, we will give the name, the email, and the blog as a list. Like we will see in the, when we run the example, we see that when we're, we, we create the user, it will show that the blog is, uh, is uh, null and have this format because we didn't create uh, we didn't create any block first uh, we have also the class config where we have the ORM mode here is also uh, a class of uh, show block we have the title body creator the, when we, we do creator we show the user so we show the name the email and the, the blog that he creates uh, uh, we have also the login username and password we have the token, the access token, the token type, and the token data based on the user name as an optional string one. Uh, here is the token using uh, Python uh, Jose, a library that implements GWT. So it's just some parts of creating a try catch and uh, to, to see an if else to create the, the, the token and encode it and decode it. Uh, this one related to, to the or double authentication password using FastAPI security. We have this uh, this part FastAPI security to see to see this uh, the, the out password bearer. We will see it in the example when we run. And here is this one called the get this function called uh, current uh, user. We get the current user based on the credential that we used in the in the out bearer. Uh, this one hash the password. So we need the password hashed in the database. That's why we use BigRibs and we use Passlib uh, uh, library. At the core, we have uh, some uh, some uh, functionalities or uh, some routes. Our routes, but this is the the main route, the login. In uh, the API, in the login part, we have a function called login. That's uh, depend on requests and database. Also use the user schema, the user one, the model user, and uh, just an if else, if, uh, if not user, rise an HTTP exception where the user, the envelope, the credential, if not the password hash, something like that, encrox password, like if he found not the same password, he will encrox password, the access token, if he found the user, and this is, he will return the user if he found the access token and the token type, bureau. I see here. This is the block, the route of the block. Almost, almost of the route of block uh, are are, are a crowd that I create in this API. So you will see that's just I return block, I read the block and get all a function in the block that called get all to get all the blocks. Uh, create I call the create uh, function here. Also I call the create for example show that will show the block uh, show by the ID I guess yeah show the block by the ID. Uh, here we the list the block a uh, function called destroy. So if you check for example the block part, we got get all function, create function, also destroy function. Uh, we have also the update function and all of this. All of this is based by test API ex HTTP exceptions and status just for uh, for raising an issue if we got if we got one. Uh, and we create all of these uh, functions based on the models and the schema that we create, the models from the database and the schema that we create with Pedantic. We add, for example, the title request, the body request body, and the body will find this in the variables in the, the class block in our schema. So we found, we call this and we create this instance. So to run the project, we create uh, the first, the first API instance with the title description and version. We call only the fast API, fast API and requests. And we call all of our functions. I add a simple uh, template, a uh, static one using Twitter and something like that. Here we include our routers. I include the out routers, the blog routers and the user router. Uh, 
this is the the, the main route uh, when we will run the project it will show it will return the the index.html template so let's get started let's run the project i will use to run the project uh, docker uh, uh, i run the project before in docker so maybe if you use docker you could run it so we just created let's see the local host yeah Kaboom. it's just a simple one place ah this is the docs and the docs are provided by uh, by swagger ui i see so once we get start first we will create the user so here is he will give you the argue uh, the the doc string here to create a new user the arguments and the, what we he will return so when we create an a uh, user we'll add for example here our was email.com great we create now the user we have uh, the response body we have the name string and the email string uh, email.com and the blog how i said it's uh, we don't have any data because uh, we just create the user now we have a success response uh let's authenticate the user uh what i said it was this like we'll add string of us email dot com and we'll do the the password that we created before string string yeah don't get with this client id client secrets and all of this just string email password yeah now we are authorized how i see this is the all out uh, to password bureau we are now logged so if we check for example this functionalities that depend on uh, the user can be logged <coughs> we could run for to get all blocks we don't have any block so we could run for example to create a blog uh, for in the title we could uh, create like hello pajamas here in the body blah 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 when we run when we execute query we'll get that we create our blog called the hell in the body blah 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 the id one the title hello pajamas with the user id is one so when we will run again the, to get all blocks, we'll find that we have this with the title, hello, pyjama, body, blah, 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 creator, the name string, the email string, and what block he creates before. So we found this, this block. Uh, let's run now the function to, to get the block by the ID. So how he said this, this block have the ID one. So we'll run the ID one and we get this block with the title, the body and the creator. Well, that's what we will get first. We could also that's generate for us a, a, a curl command. So we could run it in, a, in our terminal, in our CLI. Let's try. So when we run this like that, we will get uh, a JSON, a JSON format response where we have title and all of this. Everything now is great. Let's let's see, for example, the user functionalities. For example, get the user by the ID. We'll run the one ID one. We'll get the user that his name is string, string email, uh, com, uh, blog, where we have hello pyjamas, blah, blah, blah. All of this. Uh, get the users. This gets all the user in the database. So we will find only the, the string one that we create right now. We have also the functionality to update the blog. Uh, we give the ID. Here we give the ID one. As we said before, we have the blah, blah, blah. Now the title will write, hello world. Uh, at the string will write, uh, hello pajamas. Don't write this boat. We'll execute. Now it's show the response is updated. Uh, when we will check, uh, the first command that we run, we'll check our first get, it gets all blocks. When we execute, we'll find that it's changed. Hello world in the title and in the body, hello pajamas. So we change our our uh, part of uh, the block. Now we see this is uh, all of the all of the part that I would like to show in this demo and how to run it. You could try try this 
uh, with yourself. If you want, if you would like to not interrupt and uh, run the project locally or something like that, I host the project in Heroku. You could just run this. So the API Heroku application dot com. Uh, maybe it will take some time. But when you run it, you will get the same things that we try to do right now. Yeah, how you see. When we run it, we'll get all of this that we do, we get right now. If we try get user, for example, we found any user. We could uh, create a user here in Heroku, for example, string, string, uh, at email.com. Now we create the user from the from the from this link API to Heroku. And we got the we have a user called string string. So this is just some functionalities that I would like to show you in this demo. Uh, back to our slides. Uh, the best resource to to understand fast API is the official documentation. You could also understand some functionalities in Starlet or uh, in uh, Pedantic. You could find it public in the official documentation of Pedantic or Starlet. So you could check just some functions and get started with FastAPI, play around some, some functionality that uh, FastAPI provides. Uh, this is some pre-built packages. This is FastAPI user, a widely user authentication system. Uh, FastAPI crowd routers. Uh, this is the SQL model by Sebastian to interact with the SQL models using Pedantic. Uh, the, for for FastAPI, this is Trotuas ORM, an ORM also that interacts with your database and your application. This is Piccolo, also an ORM. And this is my package, a notification and authorization package. So mostly this is some packages that I would like to provide. But you could also see some other projects in this uh, link, awesome projects. Uh, repository that should that provide a lot of uh, a lot of uh, utilities. For example, if you would like the authentication, the email, the utils. Uh, if you would like to learn, you could learn, for example, by the official resource, external resource, uh, resource and some tutorials. Here you could find it. So thanks, thanks for having me, and uh, happy that you understand somehow fast API. And uh, see you in the next event like that. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much. And sorry for all these problems. I hope that <laughs> if if we have you here the next time, things will work out a little bit better. But no that, that's, that's what happens with live events. And um, that's what makes watching these things fun. So again, thanks for introducing us to Fast API. And you you did post uh, the, the link in the local chat, and we posted that in the public chat. So uh, everybody who wants to look at the API can uh, check that out later. And with this, I'm going to thank you once more again, and then make sure we get the next talk started. So thanks. Thank you, Bye. Martin. And so we, uh, I had a lot of time talking about our sponsors, uh, so I will just not do this for the next talk. As soon as we can get Tina ready to talk to us, uh, I'll just wait for her to show up. Um, um, because, of course, she has been waiting and there is the picture. So hello. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Yeah, well, suddenly, very quickly, we thought, oh, we have time for you now. I'm, I'm sorry you had to wait 10 minutes. Um, no we have a very long break coming up, so you don't have to be faster. Uh, I just see it as a way that people just get more fun, free content if we talk a little bit more. Um, when I read the title of your talk, I thought like smart farm, maybe it would be a computer farm or something, but it's actual farming, isn't it? <laughs> In some sort, yes. It's just like uh, a, an idea they came out of uh, from my father. So I, I help him deliver what he always wanted to do so he can go on vacation and not have to worry about watering the, 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 the soil and crops. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about this, but I'll tell you this later when you're done with it. And uh, you said that you wanted to show a video. I'll watch it uh, when you are going to play that. Is that going to be in the first minutes of the talk or is it in the no, middle? No, no, it's more at the later, at the end. Okay, the uh, if there's any tr problems with this, we'll, we'll sort it out. So I'll put your slides on the screen and okay. hope that we're going to enjoy your talk. So 
Uh, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, first off, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever you may be. Uh, my name is Tina, and today I'll talk about the smart farm. So, who am I? Uh, I? I've been a volunteer for the past several years for my NGO of Active Citizens, and Smart Farm is one of the projects that we did. So uh, I, I did it on my own. As, as mentioned earlier, it was just uh, uh, my father being lazy, and this is how we, we started to uh, to work out automated things. Um, so I am a computer and mathematics engineer, more a data scientist, but this was just a thing about being bored. So sometimes when you're bored, you, you, you come up with some creative things to do. So let's get started. What we have, uh, what, what I have prepared for today. So first we're gonna describe what the problem was and everything uh, related to that. Then the technology that is gonna be, that was used for this solution, a blueprint of how things have been connected. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about devices and uh, present some code. Um, how to improve the application because it's not the best. As mentioned, I'm, I'm a, a self-taught Python programmer, so there, there always can be some improvement and whatever. And then we'll conclude. So why even bother? So imagine that you have your apartment or a house and your, and your soil to cultivate it is miles, miles and miles away, for example, 20 kilometers, 40 or whatever. And you don't want to go through all the trouble to always go there just to do a small little task. Um, or uh, that you want to go on vacation and have a worry-free vacation like our old man here enjoying a beer and uh, relaxing when somebody else is doing the work for him. Or if you don't have another person that can actually take care of, it, of the soil for you. So we want to achieve independence and uh, how can we go about it? So how can we go about it so when we come back from our task, there is always fresh fruits and vegetables waiting on us. So what the problem? Um, somewhere in the middle of nowhere is this farm. And uh, there is, of course, no water, no electricity, and no internet. Far, far away from any socialization or humanization or whatever you want to call it. Um, so the first problem was how to get the electricity uh, to the field. So for that, we find a solution to implement solar panels that are charged with batteries. And this is all stored in a protective setting. Uh, then the next step was how to get the water. Uh, water was actually, there is a nearby spring and the tubes and the pump were connected where the pump pumps the water from the spring into the big, huge container. But the problem here with the water is that you, you how to implement that the water, it's automatized so you don't have to go and bother with this. It's not such a big field, but it's like a semi-field to be watered. So what was the initial solution? There was a, a two day, um, every second day uh, uh, switch uh, implemented and the watering was always happening every second day. But this can present a problem because if it rains, then you, uh, you waste resources. But if it doesn't rain and you need another watering session, then um, uh, the, the things will, will dry out. So, we thought about how to make how to make these things connect the technology with, with the problem that we just described. And uh, well, obviously there there needs to be an internet connection and some electronics and technology to be used to actually make everything work. So, um, what I have used for this solution first off um, to uh, to f first off there was there had to be a central server. So I, I, for that I, I chose Raspberry Pi. Which is, uh, which is taking care of the communication services and the relay connections. Then uh, Arduino to actually connect the sensors. And I, the plan was to implement three sensors, but only two are working at the moment. Uh, so one is for temperature, so the air measurements, the soil measurements, uh, humidity, and pH. And to connect this technology with everything else, um, with the, with the hardware devices, I used three programming languages. 90% is Python code. Uh, for programming Arduino, I use C++ and of course SQL to do the database. But as mentioned earlier, there is no internet. And in this field, there is not even an underground internet connection, not even dreaming of any uh, optical cables or something in the vicinity. So what we had to do is find um, uh, internet service provider that offers mobile data with a static IP. 
Why static IP? Because somewhere along the way, if you have an app and you connect, uh, you connect to your solution and to your data, uh, there has to be a static IP somewhere. Otherwise, you just can't do it. <laughs> or like you can rely on other servers or clouds, but I kind of wanted to bypass this solution. And that was something, uh, something the, mo the most feasible one that I could think of. So now let's go and, and dig into a little bit how the setup is actually constructed. First, we have the Raspberry Pi as a central server, which holds the database of uh, measurements. Uh, Arduino is connected through a USB, uh, and it's also being charged with the, five, five, uh, with the voltages delivered in from, uh, from the USB cable. And the sensors are connected to Arduino pins. The temperature, the temperature which measures um, <laughs> the air, the air uh, sensor, the measure temperature and humidity, the soil humidity sensor and the soil pH, um, three different devices. And actually to put everything together to, to, to see what, what you have done, there is an Android device uh, which uh, has the application that connects to the, to the, to the central server and communicates with the, with the whole system. Now we switch our focus and go one by one to see what the devices do in, in more detail. So as mentioned, Raspberry Pi, when it arrived, uh, it's, it's just like a chip um, and it has no hard drive or no storage devices. For that, you need to use an SD card and then you have to go online, get Raspberry N, upload it, install it. Uh, it's actually Debian based Linux system, which <laughs> made me happy because uh, it was easier to program everything and get it set up. Uh, and as mentioned, everything is on an SD card. So what does it have? It has a couple main components, which is uh, one is the SQL database that stores the data from the sensors and the Python script that takes the data with the cron uh, for, for uh, invoking the, the sensor measure from Arduino. And of course, it's a communication point with the mobile app. So you can, uh, the user can actually see the data. And why I actually made an, a mobile app? Because my father is retired. And what can you say? Like uh, he, I, I can imagine him uh, writing SQL statements to get the data of, of the measures that are actually being, uh, being conducted on the farm. So the database is very simple, a uh, couple of SQL statements, uh, three tables. One is the temperature, uh, one is the humidity, and one is for the pH. And all the tables contain just pretty much two fields beside the temperature one because it has two measures. One is date and one is the sensor measure. Uh, and as mentioned, the, the Chrome runs every half an hour. Um, the second part that connects to, that, that gets the data from the Arduino is this Python little script. Um, I, I, will, I, I put little little chunks. It's a very short script, but it's very actually very effective. Um, for import, like you always need the, the import statement to have any program running. Uh, the serial is um, the one uh, the one library that talks with Arduino. MySQL to actually um, put data, the measure, measure data into the database and date time to actually have um, uh, the measure of at what time the data was being collected. At the bottom, uh, in the middle, we have, we first have to open the database connection where you input the location, which in this case is, it was facilitated because there is a static IP address. Um, then user, password, and database. Well, this one was on a local host, of course. You cannot, you don't have to connect to the database in this with this script. But if you have it elsewhere, then this is how you would do. Um, next, uh, we communicate with Arduino. We retrieve the data. We'll see the code of Arduino later. What it actually does. We define the device, uh, define the date and time. We try to connect, uh, retrieve the data, which we create two variables. One is data and uh, pieces, which, which is split with the tab. This is how um, consecutively uh, Arduino measures, but we just retrieve the data on every half an hour. And then at the end, we take this data and put it into the, into the database. And this is how it happens every time. So they always do the last measure. If something goes wrong, um, the, the script notifies on, on screen that something went wrong and then you look at the logs that I, I, that I did collect and, and see what, whenever the measure wasn't actually done. 
Oh, then we close the connection and everything is fine and the script ends. So the next item on the list of, of, of this mess was Arduino, um, which I, I didn't put it on the internet just because I needed to, to get it um, a separate Wi-Fi uh, device on it. So it, I just made it be off, offline and uh, have, it be, have it be connected with Raspberry Pi. So there are sen uh, sensors that are connected. As you can see, I use the wires. There are always three wires that connect the sensor with, uh, with the Arduino. One wire is the communication wire. One wire is uh, for um, electricity, for um, having voltage uh, on the sensor. So they keep functioning. And one is for grounding. So um the p8 sensor at this moment just because it has 12 voltage I, I couldn't i did i'm not an electrical engineer so i couldn't i didn't know how to connect it together on, on a breadboard just because it has different voltage because the other two are, are five voltages five five voltages yes for for the electricity and send, and they can work with with no problem so as you can see here is a breadboard um on one side we have uh the, the the temperature uh, uh, sensor and the other one is for the soil that uh, like one part is missing that you put into the soil where, where it collects the humidity of the soil. So everything, one is the analog, uh, one has analog signal and the other one has a digital signal. Um, the difference is just that Arduino has the, two, the analog and the digital uh, choice where you put your pins. And this is how you connect them. And as mentioned, there are always three wires. On one side, there is uh, the grounding the grounding and um, electricity, whereas uh, from the sensor to Arduino, you connect you connect the pin, the data communications right right directly to the pins. So, for Arduino, it has its own uh, um, programming environment, and mostly it uses C plus plus. I mean, I didn't find any other way to implement Python, so I, I pretty much went with everything that was already implemented. Um, this C++ code is only 5% of the whole project, so it's it's not relevant, but I think it's relevant that we talk about it. Um, there is always include and define statements, which uh, Arduino code is split in two parts. One is the defined, uh, where you define your, your inputs, and then, then is the operational one when you actually take the measures. So what, do, what is important is to define the pin. The DHT library is imported included because of, of the sensor, which is already programmed, so it was easier to program it later. When we defined another um, pin for, for, the analogs, for the analog signal, and that one doesn't have an additional library. So when we go to the next, the script is very short, and what it does, this void loop, is where you define the, which variables you want to take from your sensors. Uh, pretty much you have to know you place them in order and this is the serial print print line you you print the line and we separate it with a tab and this is how then python knows to retrieve the data but you have to be careful that you put it <laughs> take the right data from the right sensor and put it in the right place to the database otherwise you're going to have uh, bad graphs coming up um so the last part uh of the code is this mobile python app it's um installed on an Android device. I didn't do for uh, for uh, Apple because it, well, it, there was no need. I needed Android, so that, that was why it was implemented. So the mobile app, every time you construct anything of that sort, I use Kiwi uh, and KiwiMD, and uh, I created two files. One is main.py pi, and one is smart.kiwi. The Kiwi file is responsible to actually have the front end going on so you can interact with the uh, objects on the screen whereas in the main file you define all the functionality all the functionality of the buttons then i use the matplotlib to display the data in a graphical representation and my sql connector so the application connects to the to the database um let's look at a little bit about the imports of the main py as the three key, key components were already mentioned. Um, there is there is also pandas. I use pandas to actually convert the, the SQL data to have it in pandas um, pandas data frame. So because it's easier to communicate with Matplotlib. Um, 
So the most important, the, the, the building part is the smart farm class. Um, I, uh, the main function only calls the smart, uh, smart farm class and where that's where I define the, the global variables for, uh, for the sensors, just because there are other classes and other functions that need this data to, to have it displayed. I use the global one. I know it's bad practice, but for simplicity and that everything worked, this is what I used. Um, then the important thing is get data, get data air. Uh, that's where you get connected to, to your SQL. Uh, server and get the data and this all these other um, variables are defined so when, when you log into the screen uh, you get the last measure and you have the information which we'll see in, uh, in, in, in a demo that I'll show when everything works. Um, so the, fun, the, the function uh, to connect to the um, MySQL database that is stored on a Raspberry Pi. You always you 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 put where is your host, port, database name, user, password. That's where I when I retrieve the data, I always take the whole um, the whole interval because if if I take measures on every half an hour, and the measures are be only being taken throughout the summer season when it's relevant that that the uh, that the soil needs to be watered. Um. So it's not long, and I could. <laughs> there is not the cost of the size of a of a of data that will break anything. So, and also needed to draw the graphs later on. I convert it into dependence data frame, and then I return everything. Um, so return everything. So the next part, which I think is important for the mobile app, is to look at the how things get connected with with functions from uh, the QV file which is, as mentioned, a building block of the front end of the applications when you do mobile apps in, in Python. We will look at the screen three, which is one that has a graphical representation. Here is a MyGraph humid class. That's where you take everything defined as a graph. And you have to put an ID there just because you can re then reference when you, when you want to call the um, uh, the the functions from the class, or you have to have an ID. Otherwise, they won't communicate, and you you won't get the functionality. And I use I use it there for for the bottom for twenty four hours, which which will split the graphical representation of, of the data that is retrieved on on different different sizes. And once you have these two files, the fun part comes, which is the bulldozer. I think this is the most tedious and uh, hard process of everything. When everything works on your computer, but then you have to run it through Bulldozer, then the app won't build. One in build, different problems, different settings, different requirements. As mentioned, it's a tedious process and it takes long a long time before it downloads everything, especially when you build the, the FAQ for the first time. It's, uh, it's sometimes it takes half an hour 40 minutes away time to actually have everything ready so the application compiles. Uh, so what is Bulldozer? It's, um, it's, a, it's a tool that pretty much takes your code and translates it into the file APK, which is an installable file on Android devices. So here, uh, so here um, we have to define the requirements and the thing is, for this app and Matplotlib to be implemented in it, you have to um, restrict uh, some some models to be of certain certain distribution. And if you don't, then the APK won't build effectively, and it, it will crash. And the most important thing is the backend Kiwi AG and backend Kiwi. They were used as models in the compile folder of the bulldozer, and that was a key thing that was everything making it making it actually break. But if you put these settings, then the APK will build successfully of the code that I wrote. But yeah, as, as mentioned, bulldozer is a tedious process. So the demo, let's see if uh, the video will play, share it. Oh, no. OK, here we go. It takes a little while before it loads. Um, I don't know why. It's just because it needs to connect to the database. So on the first screen, you get the last measures that were being conducted on the 26th of November. That was the time of recording. 
And this on the sidebar, you have uh, the choice to actually look at your, your graphs and your data for 24 hours, for one week, and for one month. The measures, the electricity, also, it doesn't work always there. So sometimes there is no data. So first, the graph is always the whole period. Then for 24 hours, one week and one month, what was happening with humidity. And then at the, at the back on, on the home screen, I also added two buttons, which should connect the relays. But the relays with the wires and everything was hard to implement them. So, um, OK, so this was it. We'll go back. Can we go back to the slides? No, 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 no me slides. OK, thank you. Um, so this is how this looked like. Um, and how to, of course, every application that you all, any time make in its improvements, it can always, there is room for improvements. So what I was thinking about to implement again was automation of watering with sensor measures, because at the moment I have Wi-Fi sensors or Wi-Fi relays that are connected directly to the, to their own customized application. And I want to implement it to this one. So we can add more measuring parameters to automate the watering. So it, it's based on parameters, so things turn on and off automatically, so I don't have to do it manually. And of course, some additional graphical displays to, to actually compare and contrast what's happening with crops throughout, um, throughout, uh, throughout the soil and the field where, where things are actually placed, I guess. Um, so, and uh, what, what, what's up to take out from this presentation? If you don't water the flower, it will dry out eventually. So you need water to have, to actually be fed. And all this code is open source. Anybody's free to, to take it and it can be found on my GitHub profile. So, Tom, uh, Martin? Hey. That was very interesting. Thanks for showing all this. And you solved a lot of fun problems. And you, maybe you should come back next year and present to us, like with photos of the plants or a little video, what this actually does. Because it, it's super interesting if you do this in an environment where there's no proper internet, no energy, and, and then you write a total app for a senior citizen. So that's great. Um, <laughs> And it shows also the the the, the uh, like the the, um, the normal problems you would have to just power a Raspberry Pi, so that if you are off the grip, how do you manage to make sure that that runs all the time? Because if it dies in the middle, of course, then your plants will have a problem. Yes. Uh, well, the the biggest problem in all this is the the sunlight because there are solar panels, and mm. uh, if there is no sun and the battery, something happens with the batteries, then there is no electricity and nothing works. So. Yeah, we, we had a similar thing at work in Spain where we had solar panels to power data links and our problems was that people were just always stealing them <laughs> so, so, because they are quite expensive and people, people we, they stole them so often that we replaced it with like a wind rotor, which is harder to steal. <laughs> and of course, like for at home, you can have these little two pound pumps. So I'm actually working on this myself, but only for home plants. And it's, I think it's really interesting if you have something that you can, that watches your plants for you when you're not home. So please, please come back next year and tell us more about this. <laughs> okay, if, if I will manage to build some other more fun stuff in, in, in uh, everything that I've done. So. Great. So thank you very much. And uh, if there's any questions for this, I don't see any in the, in the chat already. Uh, can people contact you and ask you stuff? Uh, sure, sure. I, I am available. Uh, well, my email in Discord. So I'll be yep. still available. So if they Okay, if perfect. Anything, but... So uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. And thanks again for taking the time to show us all of this. Okay, well, thank Bye. you. Bye. Okay, and I see somebody is waving at the bottom of my screen, and I think we've uh, told great things about our sponsors often enough, so let's welcome Bojan to the stage right now, because we're already very late. Hey! And now I've been, I've had a problem with this today because I've always been muted when I was not supposed to be muted, and uh, I think now we should be able to hear you as well. <laughs> Say hi. Welcome, everybody. It's uh, lovely to be here again. 
I was here last time and it was the coolest conference all year. And to me, it looks it's the same this year. Thank, thank you very much. And also, I have to thank you for all the help that you have given us um, behind the scenes. Because people who are watching this don't know that you've been extremely helpful. I'm always helpful. <laughs> That's of course. Well, like and, and, and you're so modest. <laughs> Okay, but uh, it's it's not always we're not we're not going to sit here and thank you or thank ourselves for uh, uh, like half an hour. You actually brought something interesting to talk about, and that's something like from monolith system to no server at all. So, uh, do you have a screen, or are you just going to tell this to us? I'm going to share. But, oh, that would be nice. Uh, I have. Let's see. Let's... Oh, I see one. So uh, since since we're already this late, I'm just going to turn this on and give you a chance to talk about it. So the stage is yours. Okay, can you see the presentation uh, quite well since I'm using just one monitor? I'm going to zoom. It looks... Everybody... Okay. So today I'm going to cover most of uh, uh, software architecture that I know about and uh, what are the pros and cons of each one. As I mentioned, I'm Boyan. I've been working as a Python developer for over a decade. I'm currently CEO of Softterific. We do consulting for a bunch of uh, other agencies. I do cloud uh, consulting, cloud architecture. I absolutely love unicorns. Uh, you have my LinkedIn. I'm always very feel to connect. I love talking with the people. Now, uh, stuff we're going to talk about are monoliths, microservices, and serverless. And the border between them is not always clear. There's some blurring uh, in between, and we're going to cover all that. Uh, what I want to share here is uh, one law This is, it's going to follow us through this, this entire presentation. Basically, to paraphrase it, structure of your code and its organization are is going to mirror the organization of your teams and uh, with that in mind monoliths are not evil or bad uh, lots of people have a version when they hear monoliths and they equal it uh, with legacy code but monoliths are super nice because you have everything on one machine it's like a cake one layer another layer and you can just pick up the plate and all is uh, nice and working. Monoliths are super nice to set up on your uh, developing environment. And bunch of applications are monoliths. Your Firefox is a monolith. Uh, my bread making machine is a monolith. And uh, for smaller teams, monolith works perfectly fine. Now, Usually we have uh, something like this one uh, huge server where we have front end, back end, and database. And they are very, very uh, nicely interconnected. Now we start uh, getting some problems with monoliths as soon as our team starts uh, growing. Around three or four or five people, you start encountering problems because we're all working on the code base and everybody's changing something differently. So the first thing that happens is that uh, front end people and back end people decide to talk with each other using APIs. So the front end goes to live somewhere outside uh, this small block here. Usually that can be some S3, anywhere where you can host a static content. We don't care about them. Also, just to say in advance, I have uh, three siblings, all of them are front-end developers. I have no idea what they did wrong, but they do front-end. I don't do front-end. Also, a big uh, thing, I designed this uh, these slides completely. So if it hurts your eyes, that is why you know why I shouldn't do design. Anyhow, we're back uh, to our uh, architecture. And here we have a nice front-end, back-end, and database. And 
As soon as users start using our machine, we're going to encounter some problems. Pieces of backend are going to be slower than we expect them to be. Uh, we are going to encounter memory problems. Database is suddenly going to start growing enormously. And then uh, we need to scale stuff. Now, the easiest thing that we can do is basically break it down. Move database to something else, some another server. For me, uh, this is super nice because I don't love uh, having to worry about databases. For example, in my case, I usually use AWS RDS service. They're going to handle backups, restores, all the other stuff uh, out there happening. And I don't have to worry about that. That's going to come uh, become important when we start going about serverless, but our job is to take as little as responsibility as possible. Let other people worry about stuff. So here we have uh, other people worrying about front end, other people worrying about database. And we are just doing back end, and everything is nice. Now, uh, as traffic starts to grow, we can do some nice things. Since our backend is probably going to be in container, because everything is in containers these days, we can just spin up 10 instances of backend and everything is fine. No need for anything else. And for majority of applications, this works quite nicely. Now, this monolithic uh, approach has a couple of problems. One of them is you deploy everything at once. When you're working in a small team, that's not a problem at all. Usually you want to do that. Second problem is if you mess something up, you mess everything up. Usually if I create a bug here and deploy it, I'm probably going to kill entire backend. But since there's only two or three of us working on the backend, we can quickly fix it because everybody knows everybody's code. Now, what we want to do is allow people to work on the different segments of the backend and not break things completely. So the next step is to create modules. We'll nicely organize our uh, system. We know, OK, for database connection, this person is going to handle everything. I'm going to do the cool stuff with calculations. Another person is going to handle image resizing and uploading. And all is nice. We had some modularity into our backend, still using Sandvan container, but it's much harder for me to break things. And then somebody hears about microservices. Now, the uh, thing about microservices is that they are cool. I'm going to go into much detail later what microservices bring to the table, what they don't bring to the table, but everybody loves microservices. You're going to listen uh, about tech companies bragging about how many uh, microservices they're running. Netflix, ha Netflix has 2,000 microservices. Another company has 3,000 microservices and so on. Now I'm going to share one huge and very important uh, life secret. Just because a huge tech company is doing it, that doesn't mean it's the right approach for your small team. Microservices bring all the complexity of managing distributed systems. And it's one of the hardest thing in uh, computer systems. You do not want to do that unless you have to. OK. First thing uh, we're going to notice when we start working with microservices is that they allow they allow us to scale parts of our system. For example, if we do image processing for uploading, we need to have image in three uh, different uh, resolutions. That's very nice. Our main uh, backend that does logging, reading from database, we don't have to worry about it. We're just going to leave that to another microservices and scale it up and down as we need it. Other way, 
uh, if you notice that this part is starting to eat more memory, we can do horizontal scaling. And that is going to work nicely. Not ideal, but it's going to eat more resources than we need. We can do vertical scaling, where we take a bigger uh, server, for instance, and run our code there. Also, a bit of overkill, because the bigger the instance, the more money you uh, have to pay. So here, we have identified what we want to run outside of our system, and we have a good reason uh, to do so. Now, uh, this is the main point, having a very good reason to use microservices, because they are cool, but they add complexity. And less complexity you have in your life, it easier it is. Also, I'm going to get back to the Conway's law. In the beginning with Monolith, we had one team working on Monolith. Now, uh, here, when we create microservices and we have our main team, we're probably going to end up with two separate organizational units. Team who is working on uh, image processing and team who is working on the main backend. And uh, we get another benefit. We don't have to deploy everything at once. Backend team can deploy backend service anytime they want. They don't have to consult uh, image team. Image processing team can deploy their service without a crashing backend. They just need to agree on API. And when you have uh, hundreds of smaller teams that are all deploying at the same time, that's a very, very good thing. Because if you Netflix had to gather all the teams, things and make a big release, well, it's a lot of people would have to wait a lot of time to watch their binge series. And this is the important stuff. If you break your microservice, you're only breaking your microservice. So for me, that's a very huge part of uh, microservices because I usually break stuff. And this way I make as little damage as possible. As I mentioned, they add complexity. And distributed systems are one of the hardest things. And then you can add Kubernetes on top of them and it turns into a nightmare for managing. Now, here is the hardest stuff about microservices. Microservices allow you to isolate data required by microservice. In ideal world, uh, your backend would use a different database if needed from your microservice. They would not communicate from the same database. That way you can avoid data corruption simply because your microservices uh, decided to delete uh, some rows. And also you have, for example, payment processing. And if your image processing interacts with database and accidentally deletes something for payment, well, that's the stuff uh, where you go to visit people in jail. So this is nice, but doing this is extremely hard because this requires refactoring databases. We all know about refactoring code, but refactoring databases is a whole new level of complexity. Because when you do refactoring of databases and breaking it out, you need to handle uh, foreign key references. Suddenly you have multiple databases and you need to make sure that the data between them is consistent. Uh, there's a latency added. So your microservices may actually end up uh, making your system slower. You also need to take into account how are you going to handle if your microservice is uh, down. Uh, do you still uh, book, for example, you want to publish uh, image covers that was uh, delivered by your image processing service? Do you still publish and when it's available, it's just going to show up or do you wait? And that depends on your domain. Do you value more uh, high availability or consistency? It's not easy. 
anyhow, this is uh, what we're going to end up. Front-end, back-end, our microservice, database, and another database. As I mentioned, breaking uh, one database into two smaller databases, that's going to be a majority of the work. But once you start going that way, things are much easier. You want them to be as isolated as possible. Also, this is how I recommend starting with microservices. Take one part of your existing backend and create a microservice from it. And uh, to make things even easier, you can create a proxy server right between your backend and frontend. And this allows us to do pretty nifty things. Your request can go to the backend, and in meanwhile, in the background, you can create image processing service. And then from your proxy, you add some rules, tell them, okay, everything going to this path, instead of backend, can go to the microservice. And then you can compare and see everything is working. If something goes wrong, and first time you deploy something, it's gonna go wrong, you can just redirect it to your backend. No problems at all. So this is how I would suggest starting things out. Don't try going for 5,000 microservices at once. You do not have usually the organizational complexity needed for that. And you do not have uh, enough teams to work on that. You use uh, microservices when you want to reduce the complexity. Uh, I mentioned earlier that managing distributed systems is probably the most complex things in programming. There is only one thing uh, that is more complex than that. It's managing people. So if you have 20 people and you have to manage all of them uh, at the same time, you can break them down in teams. Give one team to work on the back end and one team on the service for processing images in our case you suddenly have two smaller teams. That is much easier to manage. So microservices add complexity in programming, reduce complexity in management. And most expensive component, which I will come back to when I start talking about serverless, is developer hours. You want your developers to spend more time programming and less time um, having pointless meetings. And now we can talk about serverless. Okay. Stop sharing. Now you get to see me uh, here. So serverless uh, is super awesome idea. Basically what we were promised was you're going to code business logic and you're not going to worry about anything else. Now, what happened is uh, we didn't get that. Uh, we got a bunch of uh, cool serverless uh, services. Aurora, S3, SQS, where we don't have to match infrastructure at all. But the part that we were most happy about is having a function as a service, basically lambdas, where you can just write your code and then deploy it in the cloud. Uh, thing is, this is super nice in theory. In practice, having a bunch of functions all over the place doing uh, stuff makes them very hard to manage. It's something I'm still trying to learn and take a handle of it. Good thing about serverless is that people will always tell you, oh, my application is so much better right now because with serverless, I'm spending uh, five bucks uh, on entire infrastructure. I set up an API, API gateway and uh, I have a bunch of uh, Lambda services running around. And that's pretty nice. Thing is, you're going to have to teach another person how to handle all those things. Okay. We need to debug when this uh, Lambda function goes wrong. Now, I don't know if you ever debugged uh, Lambda functions. It's an adventure for itself. I think we could make Indiana Jones movie about it. But if you use, uh, for example, reactive uh, 
serverless functions on this, they are amazing. Basically, when something is uploaded to your storage, you trigger an event and the function processes it. Does processing super easy? It doesn't cost you almost anything. Uh, something happens, for example, client sends an email. You want to create a log of that. Also easily done by functions. AWS is a good uh, cloud provider. I mostly work with them and I got a couple of certifications, uh, but uh, usually they don't get everything quite right. And in those cases, they let you know, you can write your Lambda function, it's gonna fix our things. So that's the stuff. Lambdas are powerful uh, used uh, as a reaction to certain events. As a complete uh, replacement for backend where there are hundreds of Lambdas working behind your API gateway, I haven't worked in that complexity. That's something I'm going to explore, but uh, it would be interesting to see how you manage all of that uh, code and make it uh, consistent. So that's about all I have to share. Uh, and now questions, ask them away. Many, many questions. Okay, let's see. We don't have that many, many questions at the moment. So, uh, the uh, because the, the only question I see there at the moment is probably for the last talk. So, you have to, uh, just managed to just shut them all up. <laughs> <gasps> yep. But it's, uh, it, of course, it's uh, really difficult to decide, like, if you want to do monolith or if you want to do something serverless only, but refactoring one approach into the other one, that must be the hardest thing. Like, if, oh, if, yes. if because take, taking a responsibility out of a monolith, uh, and then, then you suddenly, um, at work, I'm affected by these things, so. <laughs> uh, you suddenly, uh, oh, questions are coming in, good. But I'll finish this one. You, you suddenly get to the point where the, with a monolith, you could at least test things in one system and make sure that everything runs. But if you begin to take little things out, then suddenly all hell breaks, breaks loose. A yeah. question is coming in. Uh, would you ever have, have multiple... Comment. Oh, you're reading uh, the comment as well. Yeah. Right. Uh, basically, you don't take things out of a uh, monolith. You keep them running at the same time as a new microservice. Yeah. And then you can compare results. And only when you're sure, then you uh, shut down, make a uh, microservice work, and then you take the component out of monolith. Mm. Never take stuff out of monolith unless you're sure that other stuff is working. Yeah, but you can also let's just have the idea like, oh, I want these new features on my monolith. And then you just say, oh, I don't want them. I I will do these as a microservice. And suddenly you run into problems. <laughs> yes. Uh, we have another question uh, that's not for me. So let's have a look at this. Would you ever have multiple services uh, at the, f I would assume this has uh, says at the front end. Uh, well, usually. And uh, there's there's a follow up. Not uh, that means not going through a single backend. So you you have your front end, and your front end will call different um, services. Yes, but I'm going to be super sneaky about that. Okay. I'm going to put uh, basically application load balancer and tell him, okay. These URLs, they go to this API. These URLs, they go to this uh, API. So front-end thinks it's talking to one thing. Actually, it's talking to many separate APIs. And if you're using uh, JVT tokens for authentication, they don't even have to have the same database. Yep. The, uh, one handles authentication. It's authenticated for everybody. What, what load balancer would you recommend for these things? Uh, I work with AWS. I would recommend uh, Network Load Balancer because it can uh, handle HTTP and HTTPS traffic. And you can look at the headers and paths and based on those uh, generate rules. I'm okay. sure Azure and Google Cloud have something similar. Would you, would you also use a load balancer if you're not putting it in the cloud and running it on-premises? 
Uh, usually, I would not. Uh, if I'm running on the premises, I'm gonna have a monolith. Ah, because okay. uh, when I was young and very silly, I was uh, installing Rabbit, uh, MQ, and bunch of messaging queue services to handle all that stuff. With mm. cloud, you pay almost nothing, and you can send uh, messages out there. They handle everything for you. you. Don't have to do administrations. I try to avoid uh, doing unnecessary stuff. Paying Amazon uh, half a buck so I don't have to do administration is a very good win for me. So mm. I don't tend to have stuff on uh, one single server. But if uh, I would use it uh, as that, I would probably set up a reverse uh, proxy in Apache or. Nginx, I believe they support yeah. that. Yeah, and Nginx is quite good at that. And there's also a, a HTTP, what's it called? A, a HA proxy, um, which you can use in combination with um, Nginx, which where you can do routing uh, while peeking at the at the requests. Because that, that's something we would did. We had we had old monoliths that were too slow, and so the solution would be to put something in there that looks at every XML request and then decides, oh, that's a not important one. I'm going to give that to the microservice, and oh, that's an important one that gives us money. That goes to the monolith. So that's also an approach you can do on premise, which is a lot of fun, but doesn't make things easier. <laughs> well, if it works, it works. I mean, yeah. Not all of the solutions are uh, pretty, but they need to make uh, some value. That's what we are paid for. Yeah. OK. And um, well, we were running a bit late today. So I think at this point, if there's no questions from other people in the chat, I would just love to thank you for coming up and talking about uh, microservices and serverless architecture. And uh, then we'll get the next talk running to get closer to the advertised schedule. So thanks okay. again. Bye. Thank you very much. And if anybody has questions, uh, feel free to ask me in Discord. Bye. Yeah. Bye. And so uh, we managed to get closer to the advertised schedule. So I'm not going to waste that by talking about our great sponsors, but I'm going to invite the next speaker, Ramon Vidobro. Uh, and he, uh, we know he is a great speaker because you may have missed them this morning, <laughs> or you may have you may have seen him. Um, that was very motivational what you did. Thank uh, you. And what you are doing now is something completely different. It's talking about clapping to the microphone, right? That's right. I don't want to spoil too much, but that's you caught the gist of it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's, that's the title. And one thing that we actually miss at these online conferences is people who give reactions and clapping and things. So uh, I'm, I'm curious uh, of where you're going to take us and give you the stage now. So here you are. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's good to be back. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, if you didn't catch me this earlier today, um, I gave a talk about mentorship, which was pretty language agnostic, um, but very, very important to core skills. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you again, but this time a, a, a significantly more technical talk that I'm hoping to take you through today. Um, not that one is more valuable than the other, of course. Um, hope everybody can hear me fine. I'm on a completely different setup now. Um, so I'm going to be having no slides, but using just my browser, my code editor, and of course, myself. So um, to get started, hi, my name's Ramon. My pronouns are he, him. Um, if you want to talk to me about any topics, uh, not just about this, but also to, um, you know, any anything else that's on your mind, please do get in touch. I'm at Hola Soy Milk on Twitter. Um, and yeah, I'm director of open source at CodeC. Um, and today, I, well, today, <laughs> this time, I'm going to be talking to you about a different topic. And today it's going to be talking about audience participation and clapping at clapping and uh, showing your appreciation for folks taking the time and effort to put on these wonderful conferences and 
talks and live streams and that sort of thing and show them your appreciation. Um, so let's get right into that. So um, being in an online conference ourselves, we have surely have had lots of situations. Maybe you've been to meetups. Maybe you've had really good internal conferences at your companies where you've had the opportunity to want to show your demonstration of appreciation for the person who took the time to create this content for you. And when that's happened, you sort of wonder to yourself, how could I do this? Um, you know, a, a couple of things I've done is just like spam clap emojis into the into the chat, or perhaps I'll do go on my video and go like this kind of <laughs> awkwardly, you know, just sort of being like, you know, I don't want to clap too loudly so as to disturb people I'm living with. But also, you know, I want to show my appreciation and that can be pretty tricky. So last year, sitting on the sofa, it's a Saturday and suddenly lightning struck. And I thought the I had the idea, what if, um, what if we had an app that all it does is when it hears in the microphone a clap, it enters a clap emoji into whatever app you're in and sends it. So you're literally clapping to your heart's content, but also being able to show that you're clapping in the chat. And, you know, because maybe the person only sees the chat, maybe you don't have, you know, your video set up. Um, yeah, it, I don't know. It kind of gives it a nice interactive feeling. So that's kind of the gist of what I was going for. And when I thought of this idea, I thought, ah, I got to try out machine learning. And this was new for me at the time. I had never done machine learning before. And if you're not familiar with it, machine learning is a, a, a type of programming, a type of programming concept where you uh, are essentially taking data. And in this case, in the case of this app, at least, interpreting that data and categorizing it so that you can use it whichever way you like. Now, when it comes to machine learning, um, one of my biggest inspirations and a dear friend of mine is somebody I'm going to show you here. Her name is Charlie Girard, and she is a uh, she is an engineer at, uh, I believe, Netlify now, uh, and she is absolutely brilliant. And she inspires me on the daily. She makes these incredible projects, um, some inspired by... Um, oh my gosh, what's the name of that show? Squid Game. Uh, so a lot of them inspired by either using brain scanners to interpret the data coming from your brain, some kind of machine learning stuff. One of them is, ah, gaze controlled interface to write code. She comes up with the most brilliant things, but she has this, she has this saying that I really love, which is useless is not worthless. And she has, she brings this to the work that she does. So I've always really admired her apps. And so when I had this idea, I was like, I got to tell Charlie about this. She's going to love it. And lo and behold, I was right. <laughs> so I DM'd her and I'm like, hey, Charlie, um, I got this idea for an app. Um, what do you think? And she's like, oh, my gosh, I love it. Um, you should totally use that with Teachable Machine. And I was like, ah, cool. Uh, quick question. What is Teachable Machine? <laughs> and and this was sort of like the starting point to sort of lead me down the path of trying to figure out um, how to make my own machine learning app that I can use to apply fun, creative ideas to. So if you're not familiar with it, we're going to get into it right away. Let's take a look at Teachable Machine. Um, and what it is, it's an online service provided by Google that allows you to create machine learning models. Um, if you're not familiar with the concept, when you when you when you're dealing with machine learning, what you're doing is essentially creating a or either giving a program or creating yourself lots of different points of data that um, that this algorithm will then use to interpret whether it's one thing or the other. So you can see, for example, on this little demo video, it's sorting between what is a marshmallow, what's not a marshmallow. I hope the size is okay, everybody, by the way. Please give me a shout if it's not. Um, <laughs> you know, using using lots using lots of data to figure out, okay, what is it that's going on um, in this image or this sound? And that's, so I initially thought of going with like, oh, what if I make it so that I use posing to for it to figure out that I'm moving my hands, but that got a little bit messy. So we went with sound instead. Um, and what I'm going to show you next is how I use Teachable Machine to create my model. So here, what you see is Teachable Machine in action. Now, you've got uh, two categories for what we've got. We've got background noise and claps. So what's really cool about Teachable Machine is that I'm able to just hit that button to start recording. And right away, it starts um, 
right away it starts just like categorizing this and just being like, okay, this is like not categorizing, sorry, just saving these on the cloud. And there's different kinds of sound. There's like me coughing, me and my wife talking, um, different background, me typing on the keyboard, lots of different background noises like trucks driving by and stuff like that. Just, just recording a whole bunch of data so that Teachable Machine will have an easy time knowing what is, in this case, not a clap. Next, I recorded a bunch of claps. So you know, and with my wife's help as well, she got quite sick of it after a while. I'll admit just like me clapping for an entire afternoon, essentially. Um, but yeah, so recorded a bunch of claps into my microphone and just went at it, went at it, went at it. Um, and I got 24 audio samples of that. Now, the part that I've left out so that to, so as to not you know keep us watching this for ages is I've pre-trained the model. Once those two are done, you can press this button here to train the model. And what it'll do is just like build a set of data for that that'll let it, when you start applying this, recognize what is a clap and what is background noise. So with all that done, I can click here to try it out. And I'm going to try it out right away, right now. Now check it out. Right now I'm talking, and sometimes it's kind of being categorized as a clap, sometimes not. But most of the time, you can see at the bottom that as I'm talking, the Teachable Machine is categorizing with a percentage of certainty, how certain it is whether what I'm doing is background noise or a clap. Now, it's, and it's not perfect. The more data I supply to it, the better that, that data uh, certainty will get. However, I've been talking for a while. Let's try clapping. I'm just going to move my microphone away so I don't clap into everybody's ears. And here we go. <laughs> eh? How about that? So <laughs> I got really excited when I tried this. So with this, I'm already able to sort of train this train this model to be able to um, to be able to uh, recognize when I'm clapping and when I'm not. I'm just going to have a sip of coffee. All right. So with that done, the next thing to do is to export that model. I'm going to stop this uh, this input here, and let's go right into exporting our model. And here's the next thing that's really, really cool about, um, about Teachable Machine. Oh, I don't think I can't. Can I? Ah, yeah. Sorry. Um, so what I see, what I see here, is that it gives me a file in what's called TensorFlow.js, which what it does is it uses. Sorry, it uses TensorFlow.js to sort of interact with that model, and right away it gives a it's just gives us right away an HTML file that we can use in order to get up and running right away with this model. And I think the important piece of code that we're going to scroll down here briefly is. Here, yes, 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 yes. Right here, what we're going, what this does here is show on our website how certain it is that it's, you know, what is being recognized is one or the other. And I think, I hope I did this right. Um, I forgot to prepare this. Yes, I do have this here. Um, can I open with? Can I open this with Chrome? Oh dear. Give me one second, everybody. I've got time. Just going to move to my other screen real quick. Please pardon the, the disorder. Uh, now, how am I going to do this? Now, nah, do you know what? Never mind. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I'll do that in just a sec. So uh, open with, let me just quickly do something here. Sorry, give me one sec, folks. I just got to open this up so that it's on my browser. How silly of me to forget. You are all so patient and kind. Yeah, so what I'm going to do now is open up this HTML file that I've got preloaded here into my browser. Yes, here we go. OK, I got to reshare my screen real quick. So give me one second. Oh, aren't you all so lovely and patient with me? I, I really enjoyed working on this project. Here we go. So uh, share my screen. OK. Uh, or yes, thank you all. Ah, 
You read my mind. Yeah, so this is the HTML file that got exported by Teachable Machine. And let's try it right away. If I click on Start, yeah, this file wants to use your microphone. Let's allow it. And what's going to start happening is the same thing that we saw on Teachable Machine. It's starting to categorize whether something is a clap or some background noise. So let's try it again. One sec. Nice. OK. So now we've got a reusable piece of HTML that I can jump on immediately and start using in order to categorize an app. So I figured, OK, I've got this. Where was I? Uh, audio model. Yes. Yeah, so I've got this HTML file. So I figure, OK, let's. that's kind of like the first half of it done. I can get something in order to. Um, in order to recognize when I'm clapping. But what about sending the um, the emoji itself? Well, I did find something that I can use with Node.js. So I was thinking, why not have a combination of a server in a server written in Node.js and a, a front end written in JavaScript and HTML that would allow me to be able to clap and send off that emoji. And in order to do the sending of the emoji, that's where something called robot.js came comes in. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but what it is, it's a library written in Node.js that allows you to automate your computer. Hmm. Pardon me. Yeah. So this is fantastic because it does exactly what I need. And I'll show you what I will, I'll show you what I mean in just a second. I'm gonna go into the documentation, get an example. I really appreciate documentation that does this. Check it out. Right away, we've got we require robot.js. We type in the string hello world and we do a key tap of enter. So actually we've got like 99% of what we need right here. Um, the only thing I have to replace in here is just replace hello world with an emoji, which is something that I've already done. So that's one half of it done. But what about the other half? What about the server itself? Let me click on this. Yeah. Um, what about the server itself? Now, um, if you're familiar with Node.js, you've probably heard of something called Express.js, which um, I could be butchering this um, comparison, so please do correct me if I'm wrong. But Express.js, I would say, is kind of the equivalent to Flask, which is a web server where you can define um, define routes and, and HTTP methods that we can have callbacks for and respond to. So here's what I here's what I figure, right? When I clap in my if I if I just go back here real quick, yes. When I clap, right, I'll have a little if statement here um, that when the clap score is over, I don't know. Let's let's be generous here and say ninety percent. So if the certainty that I've clapped is ninety percent or more, then it's going to send an HTTP request over to um, over to ExpressJS, and ExpressJS will say, "I got you. You want to clap? You got it." And it'll then call. Uh, robot.js and send in that clap as I wanted. And believe it or not, I did get most of the way there. And I showed it to Charlie and she was like, hey, Ramon, this is fantastic. Um, you know, I wonder if you could wrap this all up in a single app. And I was like, oh yeah, how, how would you recommend doing that? And she recommended using something called Electron. Now, if you're not familiar with Electron, as the website here says it lets you build cross-platform desktop apps with JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. And what's really cool about it is that, well, first of all, it's used widely. Uh, Slack uses it. Discord, the app that you're using right now, I believe, uses Electron as well. Uh, or they might have stopped recently. Anyway, um, yeah, it's quite a it's quite a it's quite a common way in order to use web technologies to build desktop applications. And I thought, ooh. Web technologies and desktop applications. That sounds like it's right up my alley. So now we'll jump properly into my code. So what you see here is my editor. I'm just going to make it just a touch bigger. I hope that's OK for size for everybody. So um, yeah, we've got a package JSON file with a couple of requirements. I've set up uh, robot.js, Electron, a couple of electron dependencies to build a proper binary out of my app. Um, Husky and prettier and precise commits just to make my code a little bit nicer to work with. And away we went. So um, if you're not familiar with Electron, what you've got is essentially a front end and a back end running at the same time. So you've got a layer of Node.js, and then you've got a web, uh, a web layer that you can use however you like. 
and use it I did. So if I go here into source and then, pardon me, into app and then, hmm, there's, ah, yes, of course, I downloaded my model. So this is what, oh, sorry. If I go back to, if I go back here, I, it's possible for me to doubt exactly to download my model or keep it on the cloud. I chose to download it and integrate it directly into my app. And then where is my index HTML? So what you see here, I'm just going to hide this briefly. What you see here is pretty much the same as that exported model here with just a couple of changes. I made some, I made some code changes. I put in a nice header that says, if you're happy and you know it, press the button and a button that when you click it, it starts up the listening, similar to what we had in that HTML file. Um, pretty much everything is the same here. I've defined a uh, 90%, uh, pardon me, a 90% resistance, uh, sorry, tolerance to how um, accurate it should be depending on the clap itself. And let's scroll a little bit lower so we can see, aha, uh -huh, here we go. Once we get here, if results scores two is bigger than the, to the tolerance, that is, if results scores, remember the first one was the clap, so that's why I got that first element in the array, is bigger than the tolerance, then I'll, on line 46, called IPC renderer dot send a clap. And that's it. You might be wondering, okay, what is IPC renderer? I did learn this. Um, IPC stands for interprocess communication, and that comes from Electron. So that's the part that's going to allow me to communicate between the, the front end, which is what you see here, and the back end, which is what we're about to take a look at. So let, we've gotten that far, right? We've, mo we've loaded up our uh, model. We've started listening to it, and once the score of the clap is bigger than 90, we send off that clap. Cool. Let's load up the back end of our file, which is what you see here. So let's have a look see. So we've created a window that's 360 by 200 pixels. It's transparent. It has no shadow and it's got a node integration. Down here, we need to do a little bit of a song and dance that I honestly copy pasted from the internet just so that Mac OS wouldn't complain too much about me wanting to use the microphone. Ah, once I've got that microphone, it'll open up the window and I've set it to be always on top because it does need to be listening at all times in order to interact with uh, robot.js. And, uh, sorry, then it loads up the index HTML file. And then we've got this here. And this is the most important part of the app. This is where it says, um, when IPC, that is the interprocess communication, receives a, cl a clap message, I just print out a console log with a clap for myself. And depending on whether I'm on Windows and Mac or non-Windows, it'll either send out this or send out the emoji itself, followed by the enter key. Then on line 60, all we do is set up the window itself, open up the window and let it run. Now, you're probably wondering, thinking, well, Ramon, you just glossed over a ton of code and sent us on your journey. Does it actually work? And I'm going to answer that live, if I may, because it turns out, oh, hold on. Let me go down to my other screen here. Oh, what do we have here? Hello. <laughs> Look familiar? So this app has been running the entire time that I have been talking to you today. If you're happy and you know it, press the button. So I thought, why not do something fun? I'm just going to set that to the side here and open up the chat that is happening live as we speak. Hello, chat. And I'm going to send some claps. I know this is very arrogant. This is not very, like, humble of me. Um, but let's start it up. It's listening. And I'm going to clap for myself now. I hope this works. This would be embarrassing if it didn't. Here we go. Hey, look at me spamming emojis. <laughs> oh, uh, it says in Spanish, you have sent too many messages. Please take a break and try it again. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> well, and that there we go. I've sent, I've now got a way so that when I'm excited about somebody giving a talk or somebody giving a really rousing um, a live stream, all I got to do is clap. I think I can, I'm going to clap once. 
And there you go. Uh, <laughs> now I can clap for everybody who wants to listen. I'm just going to stop that real quick before I make too much of a fool of myself. <laughs> so you might be wondering, okay, um, why have I, Ramon, why have you been showing us this today? Why have you, um, why have you shown us, you know, your silly little project? And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to, I want to use this as an opportunity to say, you know, if you've got an idea and perhaps you're working with a technology that you've never worked with before and you think, well, I'm not sure really how I could do this possibly, you know, everybody is so wicked smart and I don't know anything about, say, machine learning or hardware programming or, gosh, I don't know, uh, front-end programming. I don't know how to use uh, cool front-end technologies. All I'm saying is, Talk to folks around you. People love to help. You love to help when somebody comes to you. Absolutely reach out to people who know about this stuff. Have fun. Try stuff out. And I'm going to close by repeating the, the quote from Charlie. I just love this. Useless is not worthless. Go out there and have fun. So that's it for me. Uh, I just want to say thank you once again for having me, uh, Pajama Conf. And uh, yeah. Um, if you've got any question, I'd love to hear them. Oh, where's the, where's the, where's the camera? Uh, here, here's the camera. Oh, uh, this was awesome. So thanks for that. Uh, My pleasure. Yeah, the only question that comes to mind is would this uh, work on a Raspberry Pi or some small computer? Because then you could have a, like a clap sensor in your house 24 seven and do even more amazing things. That's a good question. I, I guess in theory, if you can make, um, I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen. I feel, um, I guess if you can make, um, I guess if you can make electro, I mean, I would, I would assume that technology would be different, but since tensorflow.js works anywhere, there's absolutely no reason that you couldn't bring up, um, a raspberry Pi that is in charge of listening out for claps and send, Ooh, you could even have it so that it sends claps to somebody like, I don't know, send claps to this person. And then you just like clap and it sends them on every platform, like on telegram and signal and all that. I think that'd be fun. <laughs> it would, it would certainly be fun. Like having this kind of technology with server, but anyway, it was really interesting to see what you can do with uh, a JavaScript and electron and, uh, as something that I would not expect. So let's see. Is there's? I think you swamped all the uh, um, the chat with, yeah, with the claps, the <laughs> so that if as, if if anybody has a question, uh, they should just scroll up and then send that later. But hey, this was great, and everybody who has seen this talk and not seen the one from this morning, um, you should go and uh, look at the other talk as well. Very kind. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. And uh, so I'm going to send you away to the Discord. Bye. <laughs> oh, this this is fun today. Um, uh, this has been a very long block, and there is just one more uh, talk left um, until we uh, have a, a little technical break. Uh, so uh, with all these diff different topics we've had, one thing we have not had today is crime, and uh, we had uh, we have Gajendra Deshpande, who has offered us an insight in how to build your first cyber forensic application using Python, and that talk has been pre-recorded, so I'm going to start this now to be on time. And I hope that we are all going to learn something uh, to do crime fighting with Python. Let's see. Hello, everyone. My name is Gajendra Deshpande. Today, I will be presenting a talk on build your first cyber forensic application using Python. So in today's talk, we will discuss in brief uh, about digital crimes, digital forensics, the process of investigation and the collection of evidence, setting up Python for forensic application development. Then we'll discuss some built-in functions and modules for forensic tasks, then forensic indexing and searching, hash functions for forensics, forensic evidence extraction, then about metadata forensics, then using natural language tools for forensics. So let us first uh, 
discuss some cyber crime uh, statistics so the internet uh, crime report for 2019 released by usa's internet crime complaint center of the federal bureau of investigation has revealed the top four countries that are victims of internet crimes so you can see that usa tops the list by uh, tops the list where more than 460000 crimes have been reported followed by uk more than 90000 canada more than 30000 and, and india more than 25000 then of course these are only the reported numbers but unreported numbers can be much much higher according to rsa report mobile transactions are rapidly growing and cyber criminals are migrating to less protected soft channels that is because many people are not aware of different security settings available in their mobile phones then according to an article published in uh, indian express on 19th november 2016 over 55% millennials in india are hit by the cyber crime so these are the people who are born after 1995 and between uh, 2010 so they use gadgets heavily so because of that they are the uh, targets of um, cyber criminals then a recent study by checkpoint research has recorded over uh, 150000 cyber attacks every week during the covid-19 pandemic there has been an increase of 30% in uh, cyber attacks compared to previous weeks let us uh, see the definition of forensic science it is the use of scientific methods or expertise to investigate crimes or examine evidence that might be presented in the court of law then cyber forensics is the investigation of various crimes happening in the cyber space examples of cyber attacks include phishing ransomware fake news fake medicine extortion and insider frauds then according to dfrws that is digital forensics research workshop Digital forensics can be defined as the use of scientifically derived and proven method toward the preservation, collection, validation, identification, analysis, interpretation, documentation, and presentation of digital evidence derived from digital sources for the purpose of facilitating or furthering the reconstruction of events found to be criminal or helping to anticipate unauthorized actions shown to be disruptive to the planned operations now if you look at this definition it has got two parts the first part speaks about the procedure of investigation and second part focuses on the importance of reconstruction of events and identifying the evidence through the reconstruction of events so that the evidence can be presented in the court of law now we have got six steps in the digital forensics investigation process so first one is identification then collection uh, third one is validation fourth is examination fifth is preservation and finally the presentation in identification step what happens is the investigation officer will visit the crime location and he or she will try to identify the different objects which can be the sources of evidence so examples of sources of evidence can be the uh, mobile phones gadgets even toy devices which looks lo- which looks like uh, toys but they can be the digital gadgets even the physical cables and so on then the next step is the collection now collection of evidence is an important step so in this case if the system is turned on and if all the tools are available for collecting the evidence then they can perform live forensics live recording of the uh, information otherwise they can just simply pull the plug and take the system to the lab and extract the data so important point here is that they should not turn on or turn off the system because that will change the state of the system and that may alter the evidence then when they are collecting the uh, evidence they need to collect the most volatile information first and finally the least in volatile information has to be collected last then third one is the validation now note here that they are collecting the information then they will perform the uh, analysis on the uh, information so the important point to note here is a, here is that they should not be performing uh, examination on the original data they need to perform it on the copy of the data once they complete their validation they need to check the hash of original data and the copied data and they need to ensure that it is the same if there is a change then the evidence will not be valid so this can be done using simple hash algorithms like sha256 which we will discuss it in our next few slides 
Then fourth step is the examination. So in this process, different pieces of evidence will be identified and the investigation officer will try to find the link between uh, different pieces of uh, evidences. Then fifth step is the preservation. Uh, once the examination is done, uh, the evidence needs to be stored in a uh, safe place at, a tempor at appropriate uh, temperature and in a safe locker. Uh, for example, even the uh, hard disks or even the pen drives, they can keep them in, in the antistatic bags or FADA bags so that they can be stored in a proper place and they need to ensure that it is tamper proof. Then finally, the presentation, this is a very, very important step. So whatever steps you have followed till now, it needs to be followed as per the procedure laid out by the law enforcement agencies. If it is followed, then it can be presented in the court of law. Otherwise, court may not accept this evidence. Now let us look at the important uh, concept called as Daubert standard and how it is related to uh, Python, especially in case of uh, forensics. So in United States federal law, the Daubert standard is a rule of evidence regarding the admissibility of expert witness testimony. So a party may raise a Daubert motion, a special motion in Limen raised before or during trial to exclude the presentation of unqualified evidence to the jury. So illustrative factors are, the court has defined the scientific methodology as the process of formulating hypothesis and then conducting experiments to prove or falsify the hypothesis and provided the set of illustrative uh, factors. So these illustrative, illustrative factors are, has the technique been tested in actual field conditions and not just in laboratory? Has the technique been subjected to peer review and publication? What is the known or potential rate of error? Do standards exist for the control of techniques operation? Then has the technique been generally accepted within the relevant scientific community? Now in 2003, Brian Carrier published a paper that examined the rules of evidence standards, including Daubert. There are many standards, so Daubert is one of them, and compared and contrasted the open source and closed source forensic tools. So one of his key conclusions was using the guidelines of the Daubert tests. He concluded that open source tools conform to the Daubert standard. They conform more to the Daubert standard compared to the closed source tools. So since Python is open source, it automatically conforms to the Daubert standard. So just because it is open source, we cannot say that it conforms to the open, uh, Daubert standard. So the, it satisfies the illustrative factors. So in case of um, uh, Python, these questions can be asked. So can the program or algorithm be explained? This expression should be explained in words, not only in code. Has enough information been provided such that thorough tests can be developed to test the program? Have the error rates been calculated and validated independently? Has the program been studied and peer reviewed? Has the program been generally accepted by the community? So these are the illustrative factors which needs to be considered and Python satisfies all these illustrative factors and obviously it conforms to the Daubert standard. Now let us look at setting up uh, Python for forensic application development. So there are some factors which needs to be considered. That is your background and your organization uh, support. So are you active in Python community? Are you contributing to the uh, Python community? Are you interested in contributing to the open source projects? Then how is the support of your organization? Does it support the development of open source tools or it, is it just uh, buys the uh, commercial tools and use it for the investigation and so on. Then choosing the uh, third party libraries. So this is again a very, very important uh, uh, factor here because there may be many third party libraries, but you need to ensure that it is compatible with the present version of Python, which you are using to develop the uh, tool. The next ID is and their features. You can use uh, IDEs, there are very good IDEs, uh, such as PyCharm and so on. So they can actually help you to save a lot of time uh, in the development of a 
program because of their uh, smart intelligence features then installation so when it comes to the installation again you have got uh, various options either you can install them on your uh, machine if it is uh, you, you can install them on your laptop or on a desktop or you can go for cloud installation or you can use the platform such as replit and github and you can do everything online then right version of python uh, note here that it is also very very important uh, just because python's recent version is available you should not be using it you also need to ensure that it runs the code runs on the different platforms and it is compatible with the third party libraries which you are using then next one is the graphical versus um, shell so generally beginners uh, tend to use uh, graphical editors whereas the experienced people or uh, the geeks they tend to use shell and if you compare graphical versus shell environment shell is environment is highly customizable so basically it depends on uh, your need requirement and your experience now let us see some built-in functions and modules so on this slide you can see the list of built-in functions available in uh, python so you can use these built-in functions and write the basic uh, forensic tool for example you can use hash function you can use memory view function and you can use range function and so on so now on this slide you can see a small code which basically generates the ip addresses so the base address has been defined as 127.0.0 so we are generating the last digit that is from 0 to 255 so here we are using a range function then we are using range array and we are just generating the IP addresses from 127.0.0.1 to 127.0.0.255. Now, similarly, you can write a small code which just prints the uh, directory names and the files in the present directory. So, for that, you need to import the module called as OS, then use get CWD function. So, that is get current working directory then use a list dir method on the present working directory so it will print all the names in the directory in the present directory the next uh, topic is forensic indexing and searching so for indexing and searching you can use the simple file search and index functions available in uh, python so for example you can define a variable uh, called a search words and you can create a you can set it as a set so then you can read the contents of keywords.txt file and store them in uh, file words then you can do some basic text processing on the words inside the file then we are checking whether the python word is present in the search words that is in the search words set so if the word is found, then we print it's found. Otherwise, we print we print not found. So basically, uh, this is an example which shows how you can write a simple Python code to search for specific evidences in a file. But this method may not be feasible because it it works on the small amount of data. But if the data is huge, then we need a different uh, method. For that, we need to use a library called as Hoosh, it, which can be used for forensic indexing and searching. So basically, it was created and is maintained uh, by Matt, and it was originally created for use in online help system of uh, uh, side effects uh, softwares, 3D animation uh, software called as Houdini. It's again a pure Pythonic library. It supports fielded indexing and search it supports fast indexing and travel so it also has a powerful query language if i have to say in short then using whoosh you can build a local search engine for the uh, collected information so you can see here how the code is written 
So first you need to import the required, required um, uh, libraries. Uh, then define a schema. So in schema, you can mention the uh, title, then path and the context, then create the schema. Then you have to go on adding the documents so you can add the location here. Then once you add the all the uh, documents, then you need to build a query parser. So in query parser, you are basically going to search for the required evidence or required piece of information. So basically you have built a small search engine by adding documents and then by building the query parser. Okay. The next is the hash functions. So we know that the hash functions are used for integrity check. Basically, we want to ensure that the whatever data we have collected, it is not altered, it is not tampered. Okay. So for example, uh, to ensure that you can import the hashlib library in um, Python, right? So here we are using chart of the six method to compute the uh, message digest. So here we have defined, we are using two messages. One is message M and second one is message X. So in on this slide, the message M is split into two parts. And finally, we are computing the digest on message M. Then we are also computing the digest on message X. Then we are checking whether the digest of message M and the digest of message X is same or different. So in this case, you can see that it's the same. So that means it's not been tampered. But in the second case, what I have done is I have added the additional space at the end of message X and then calculated the message digest. Now, after comparing the message digest of M and message digest of X, now it says that it's false. That's because I have altered the message X. The next is uh, forensic evidence uh, extraction. So for this, you can use several libraries. For example, if you want to extract the information from the image, or if you want to take the screenshot of, of the screen, then you can use library called as Pillow. So Pillow is Python's image imaging library, which adds image processing capabilities to the Python interpreter. So it supports various uh, file formats. Now you can see here, that we are using exif tags and gps tags so exif tags can be used to extract the information of files such as file name file size when it was created and so on whereas in case of gps tags it can also extract the location information such as longitude latitude and so on basically it captures the gps location of files The next is uh, PyScreenshot module. So it tries to allow to take screenshots. So without installing third-party libraries, it is cross-platform, but mainly used for Linux-based distributions. So it's Py, Py screenshot uh, module uses the wrappers of image processing libraries. So here in this case, uh, PyScreenshot has been installed but as a wrapper to pillow library. Now, this is an example which takes this screenshot of entire screen. So to do that, you need to import the PyScreenshot screenshot um, library, then uh, use the grab method to capture the screenshot of the entire screen, then use the save method to save the save it as an image. Then if you want to take the screenshot of only part of screen, then you need to specify the coordinates x1, y1, and x2, y2. After that, it will take the screenshot of the specified coordinates. Now, if you are really interested in performance, then you can uh, go for it. But in case of forensic, performance does not matter. What matters is the evidence. But if you are interested in uh, performance, then you can do some tweaks like setting the child processes to zero and by changing the backends to Scrot or MSS, you can improve the performance, but it's not really required. 
The next is the metadata forensics. So metadata is nothing but data about data or information about data. So it is basically related to the various uh, file properties. Now mutagen is one Python module that is used to handle all your metadata. So it supports uh, file formats as MP4, MP3, Ogverbis, and so on. So it's also a standard uh, Python library. It has no outside dependencies except the Python standard library. Now on this slide, you can see that you can extract the information related to Ogverbis file. So it prints uh, information such as the file information. So it says that it's the Ogverbis file and the duration or the length of the audio file is 346.43 seconds. Then its bit, bit rate is also mentioned. Then similarly, you can get the metadata information of a flag file and also the metadata information of an MP3 file. You just need to use appropriate functions. Then next, if you want to extract the information uh, related to PDF files, that is you want to extract the information of PDF file and as well as perform some processing on PDF files. So in that case, you can use a PDF uh, file called as um, a PDF module called as PyPDF2. So it's a pure Python library built as a PDF toolkit and it is capable of extracting document information such tile, title, author, file name, file size, when it was created, etc. when it was modified, last, et cetera, et cetera. You can split the documents page by page here. You can merge the documents page by page. Then you can crop the pages. You can also merge multiple pages into single page. You can encrypt and decrypt the PDF files and so on. Then next, if you are interested in uh, performing metadata forensics on PE file, that is portable executable file. So this portable executable file is Windows operating system related file. Okay. But you can perform analysis on any operating system wherever you install this PE file. You can install it on Windows and do the metadata forensics. You can install it on Linux and do the metadata forensics. You can install it on Mac and do the metadata forensics. It's perfectly fine. So what it does is it makes available the P file headers and makes them accessible. And also it makes accessible sections, details, and the data. The structures defined in the Windows header files will be accessible as attributes in the P instance. Then P file requires some basic understanding of the layout of the P file. So some of the tasks which we can do with P file module is that it makes possible inspecting headers, analyzing sections data, retrieving embedded data, reading strings from resources, then warning for suspicious and malformed values, overwriting uh, fields in a safe way, then PID signature generation and so on. The next um, topic is using natural language tools. No, no, using natural language tools is very, very uh, important nowadays, especially for forensic tasks. That is because we have got huge amount of information available in the text format. And one more problem is that the text may not be available in the single language. So we need to perform a lot of things such as transliteration, translation, lemmatization, named entity recognition, and so on, and try to identify the correct meaning. So basically, NL, natural language tools help us to examine the text for evidence using NLP concepts. So there are various uh, types of libraries. So in the first category, we have got NLTK, Spacey, and Textacy. So these are the most standard libraries available for English language or Western languages. Of course, uh, NLTK supports some sort of Indian languages also. So Spacey is industry standard tool for uh, performing uh, natural language processing. Then we have got Stanza and uh, Polyglot. So Stanza was earlier known as Stanford NLP. It's available in Java as well as in Python uh, languages. And Polyglot is the huge library which supports more than 100 languages. 
for NLP tasks. Then if you are only restrict yourself to Indian language processing, Indian language, national language processing, then you can consider these two tools that is INLTK and Indic NLP libraries. In case of mixed languages, you can combine one or more libraries and perform natural language processing to identify the evidence. So in summary, it is very important to follow the standard procedure led by the law enforcement agencies during investigation process. Otherwise, the evidence may not be considered by the court. There are many open source as well as commercial tools for digital forensics. Learning to develop your own tool is always advantageous. It can save a lot of money. That's the greatest advantage. Then many tools written in Python are pure Python implementations. You don't need any additional libraries. Just the dependency of standard Python library is sufficient. And most importantly, Python and open source tools comply with Dauber standard. Thank you. Thanks very much for this. Uh, uh, Gajinda will be back uh, in, in a few hours uh, with another security-related talk. And it's surprising how time flies here, because block number two is already over, uh, which means now it's time for a technical break and a switch over to the next block, uh, where we'll have Jason as a host. Jason. Uh, is an experienced host and I think he, he's going to do a very good job and uh, in a couple of hours you will also meet me uh, in, in that room. Um, before that uh, I would like to uh, remind you of the things you can do while we are uh, doing the technical break. Uh, there is the uh, one thing, and I will uh, hopefully run this as a ticker. There you go. Uh, there is the Discord. Uh, if you join the Discord, it, it's your easiest way to all these other links, because uh, we don't really expect you to type in all these long links. But uh, if you go to the Discord, to the announce channel there, um, you can win one of 10 hardcover books uh, of Pact. Uh, there is a Google form to be filled in, and uh, if you're in the EU or uh, the US, you can even have a real book you can touch. So that's the chance and you should be doing that. And if you would like to be on the other side of the screen, then we have lightning talks. Uh, there is a form uh, where you can enter uh, the uh, lightning talk session, uh, which uh, has not shown up in my schedule, but if I'm correct and maybe choke can type that uh, because she's there maybe she can type that in, in the com in the, in the chat should be at seven o'clock utc um and she says yes so i guess correctly so if you ever wanted to test if the sound on your webcam works or if you have to something to tell the world lightning talks are a fun way to uh, just do this kind of thing um and I think uh, we had that. We had the other sponsor, Microsoft, who, who also uh, are in the um, Discord and offer you uh, a, a, a way of getting a crypto token. Even if you don't have a wallet right now, you can uh, leave your email there and come back to that once you have one. And of course, you can sign up uh, for uh, services. Uh, around uh, Azure, which allow you to get started with that and teach you fun things. And that's about all we have for this block. I really enjoyed having these many diverse talks uh, that I could show uh, to you today. And I'll take a short break now and come back in a few hours in the next studio. So uh, you have now 30 minutes of going to Discord, talk to other people, and then come back to the studio for Jason and more talks. So see you all there. <music>
Thank you.